last shift and return back to the topic of hybrid work, I'm joined back in the studio by Luke. So Luke, welcome back. And you are joined by Colin D. Ellis. So welcome, Colin. I'll leave it to you. I'm right here if you want any, if you have any questions right. or anything, Great. but take it away. Great to be back. Colin, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Look, you work with leaders around the globe on the topic of culture mm -hmm. and also how, how to mold and build the culture around the hybrid work current environment. Could you share with us some of the challenges that you see with leaders as well as employees they face in the current hybrid work environment? Yeah, I, when, when the panic pandemic first hit, Luke, what we had was equity of experience with regards to culture. All of a sudden, everybody was at home and we were very right. good at rolling out technology. So we had the mechanisms to stay in touch. And the organizations that thrived during the pandemic were the ones that actually put time, thought and effort into resetting their culture. They recognized that things had changed, things that, that, were, that were different. And so they reset their culture. They thought differently about how they would communicate and collaborate and the behaviors they needed to demonstrate. Now, as we come back to the work place, Luke, and we, we look to leverage some of the solutions that we see is it almost needs another reset. And so I think the biggest challenge that most leaders face right now is how, how do we be deliberate about this thing called culture? For too long, it's been an unwritten agreement between leaders and employees. And now there really has to be thought given to, if we're not all going to be in the same place and there's going to be this inequity of experience, how do we make sure that people still feel that sense of belonging to their colleagues and we know when to come together to get productive work done? That's, no, that, I, I see it in the market because the interesting thing is people lead with technology, but in essence, you almost have to lead with the culture and then technology enables that. I'm very interested to see what's the secret sauce? What are some of the like necessary conditions to kind of get it right, both the culture, but also be able to operate effectively in the hybrid work? You know, it's a great question, Luke, because I think too many organizations suffer from waiting for the perfect conditions. Right. And, and culture is pervasive, it's there all of the time. And what we need to make sure is that we're not waiting, 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 waiting for this thing called culture. In the meantime, you're losing your good staff or you're not leveraging all of the great technology that's there to enable hybrid working. And so for, for, for leaders, it's really a case of, hey, listen, we need to deal with this cultural issue right now in order to get the best from not only our people, but also from our technology. And, and so from a condition perspective, it's like now is always the right time to start working on culture. <laughs> that's fascinating because I was just having an innovation talk and that was exactly the message, like the time is now, mm. don't wait. Uh, it takes time to get there. So the sooner you get on the journey, because it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the interesting thing is, where do you see the market going? Uh, obviously, we talk about the culture maybe catching up with some of the technology, but where do you see the trends going in the near term, at least? Well, I think, I, I, again, at the start of the pandemic, you know, keep, leaders were kind of caught in this place of, is the office gone? Do I sell off my real estate or else, you know, are we going to come back full time? And I think there's this, there's still this um, uh, almost you know, kind of dissonance to sort of say, what do we do, where do we go? So I think future term, what leaders are looking and certainly the organizations that I work with, work with is, well, how do we best use that space? I think we're still some way away from kind of augmented reality in, in video. I think more desktop terminals with cameras inbuilt to reduce the amount of distraction because we're still getting a lot of people who are getting distracted by their emails when they're yeah. on their calls. Luke, so I think leaders are going to look at, well, you know, how can we leverage technology to ensure that we don't overwhelm people? Burnout still one of the biggest issues we see in our workplace cultures. People just lack the discipline around their technology. Um, and, and how do we, I, I guess, shift our workspaces to best suit the work that we need to do? Is it private, quiet work, or can we move our walls about and do more collaborative work? And so I think finding those solutions for better uh, uh, kind of office working is definitely something that we're looking That's at. That's a great point of view because a lot of people are, are you know, chasing the next shiny object, hologram, VR, great, but you have to look at the starting point, like less than 10% collaboration rooms have actually video enabled conference rooms. So start there and then think about the future, right? So to speak. If you were to wear Cisco hat, what would be some of the guidance advice you would give to Cisco? Like as we support you and the leaders obviously on this journey, what would be some of the things you would give us as a pointers? Well, I, I, you know, I still think that we make an assumption that everybody knows how to build culture. Hmm. Luke, especially in the hybrid world, you know, the way that we work has changed dramatically forever. You said this in your talk before. 
And I think you know, one of the things that Cisco needs to do and every organization needs to do is to teach its managers how to build and evolve positive hybrid working culture. Because only then do you, are you able to retain that sense of belonging, retain that sense of what Cisco is about and what it's good at, and leverage the tools that you have at your disposal to improve productivity and make sure the products remain to the quality that they are right now. Excellent. And in fact, we need to have more dialogue like this around culture, things that surround the technology. I think that's the piece that leaders want to hear as well. So I really appreciate the, the time today, opportunity to speak. I think we should uh, continue the dialogue as we move forward. Sounds great. Thanks, Luke. Amazing. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you to Colin as well. Really interesting perspectives. And thanks for bringing together the themes around, obviously, this being a technology show, but the people and culture piece is really critical. All right, we're now going to head out to a quick video. It's of Cedric wandering around the world of solutions in the event and speaking to some attendees. So let's take a look. Let's try to stop someone here and see what they have to say. Oh, they're going. They, see, they can see I'm coming. Cisco? Live! Cisco? Live! If you think about Cisco Live, what are the three words that come to mind? Oh, well, of sustainability, okay. that's a big one. People, connections, that's what it's all about. Networking, engagement, having fun. Fantastic. Networking, great spirit. New technology, security, zero trust, I think. Collaboration, sustainability, partners. Building knowledge, sharing knowledge. Great to be back. Meeting cool people. Inspiring, nice. This is the first time we heard nice, and I like it. Innovation. 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 I would say innovation. Inspiring. Big. Relationship. Vibrant. Diverse. Fun. Food. A lot of learning. If you would have to convince your friends to come to Cisco Live next year, what would you tell them? I would tell them it's a great opportunity to get together with customers from all around the world, or at least uh, Europe and Africa. You can put two years of learning into a week. Where else could you meet someone who's helping move along the mission to Mars? Than Cisco Live. Get to know the latest and greatest uh, in terms of IT. You have many people with a lot of knowledge here, so you can really ask the question you are having. How would you convince them to come to Cisco Live? Just ask them, they will be here. It has great people, great technology, and fantastic outcomes. You should come. As you can see, everybody's really excited to be here at Cisco Live in Amsterdam. It gives you enough reason to come next year, so just make sure that you're all in and you're here. All right, welcome back to Studio A, right here at the front of the hub, here at the beautiful Rye Amsterdam. Great job, Cedric. Thank you so much for bringing the energy and bringing the fun to Cisco Live with all of those new friends that you've made since you got here this week. Remember, keep sending out those social media posts, tweets, photos using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Please share your response to the content that you are hearing all day long and stay with us right up to our closing keynote with Pierre Luigi Colina, the world's greatest football referee. Right now, I've got Mohammed Imam here in the Cisco TV studio with me. Mohammed is Senior Director of Product Management for Catalyst 9000 Series. Welcome, Mohammed. So glad to have you here with us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. So, Catalyst 9000 has been so incredibly successful for Cisco. How has the portfolio really evolved over the last few years? It has been an amazing run in the last five years. We introduced the Catalyst 9000 in 2017, and since then we have never stopped innovating. We have unified the entire Catalyst portfolio in one product, which is Catalyst 9000, whether it's access, aggregation, or core. We have unified the architecture from software perspective with iOS XE across the board, single image, with one hardware architecture using the UADP ASIC, and that has simplified the user experience. That has made the operational activities for our network administrators very, very easy with the Catalyst 9000. And so the portfolio kept evolving, and last year, we have introduced what we call it the X series, mm -hmm. the X factor, um, and that is the Catalyst 9300X, our latest Catalyst 9300, which comes with 90 watt of power, multi-gigabit, one terabit stacking, and a lot of other functionalities packed in this beautiful box. We have also introduced Catalyst 9400X with Soup2 and some new line cards. And on the Catalyst 9500X and 9600X, we have introduced for the first time the Silicon One-based Catalyst 9 case. And that means additional power, additional performance, additional scale, and 
we have made the install base that was with the Catalyst 6500 back in the days, now is ready to migrate to the Catalyst 9000X. Having said that, in this Cisco Live, we are introducing a couple of new exciting products as well. We have our industry first 60 port, 25 slash 50 gig box. We have never seen a one RU box with 60 ports packed. Typically it's 48, mm -hmm. but now we are able to pack 60 port with the innovations that we have done. This box is capable of 60 ports of 25 or 50, as I said, but it also comes with 400 gig uplinks. Four ports of 400 gig uplinks. And that basically makes you ready for the new hybrid world that we are living in in the post-pandemic era. It also comes with security features, IPsec capable, MacSec ready, and it's, it's uh, software fine access and EVPN ready as well. Absolutely, so again, a lot of great breakthroughs, a lot of announcements this week here at Cisco Live. Um, Share a couple of the latest trends that we are seeing, for example, in uh, enterprise campus networks. Let's go with that. So in the enterprise networks, as you can imagine, in the post-pandemic, one of the trends that we have seen is the hybrid work. Yes. And that means more video, more mobility, um, more security concerns as well with, with, with all these, um, with, with more mobility and more people in different places. At the same time, we, have all, we are also seeing IT and OT convergence, right? A lot more endpoints are now coming into the network, which were never supposed to be on the network in the past. Things like lights, LED lights, blinds, uh, HVAC systems, they are getting connected to the, to the network. And I think one of the most trending topics of the day, especially here in Europe, is, is the energy saving and sustainability. And I think network is sitting in a very strategic uh, place and can be the catalyst driving this transformation of sustainability uh, in, in the future years. Because every, all of the enterprises that I'm talking to, they have their sustainability goals defined. I think network can play a big role in multiple ways. Number one, PoE. PoE cuts the cost for our customers, but at the same time, it brings a better form of energy with DC power. Uh, and, and second is, the, the visibility that you get with the network for energy savings. The more visibility you have of usage, occupancy in your networks, in your buildings, the more you can optimize the energy. And so that making, the, making our buildings smarter with the smart buildings, architectures, I think that is something that is going to drive sustainability from network perspective. Great, so we've got about 20 seconds left here in the section. Tell me quickly about security. How do we keep it all secure for the network? Look, I keep it simple. Gone are the days when we could do security port by port. Yeah. We have to take an architecture approach. And it has to be an end-to-end -end architecture approach with segmentation and policy as the key that you really have to have in the network. So I'll leave it at that. It's a much bigger discussion, and we can have much more discussion on that at a different segment. That is perfect. Mohammed Imam, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. We really do appreciate it. Congratulations once again. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, we are going to go back out to Rob Boyd. This time, Rob is in the NOC, and the NOC is always one of our most popular and interesting areas here at Cisco Live. Rob, I see you've corralled one of our distinguished engineers. You found Joe Clark. Yes, I thought everybody recognizes Joe Clark. Thank you so much, Steve. Joe, always easy to recognize because he never looks any older. I don't know what his secret is. He's not willing to share. Dorian Gray painting. Dorian Gray office. painting is, is doing the aging for him. Yeah. Well, Joe, you guys seem to have done a fabulous job because I haven't had Thank to think you. about what y'all are doing here, which to me is kind of the That's the what way we aim works. for, yeah. yeah we, uh, we got here on uh, January 26th. Rolled the core in from the uh, Cisco lot or the Cisco offices here in Amsterdam, and we have been building it out ever since. It's been great to be back here after three years in Europe doing Cisco Live. So we wanted to balance a little bit of the new with the known, and I think we've built a great network. And you can come by here in the hub uh, to the knock and see the heartbeat of that network. We have the statistics. We have a picture of our uh, Core One data center. We have been doing just 
almost 50 terabytes of traffic to the internet since we started and we have been we have a, a great team 60 people on site watching things making sure we don't have any issues and when we do find things we jump on them we make sure that our attendees have the best possible experience because we only have five days to make that great impression well, I'm curious too, when people are lining up here, what kind of questions are they asking your, you and your team? They kind of want to know why we did what we did and what we did. On the architecture? Like, on the architecture. Okay. They, they're like, well, why did you make this decision or why did you make it? Some people think that we, that they want to know, well, why didn't you go with this technology or that technology? And some of it comes down to making sure that we can keep things with the right amount of complexity. If something goes wrong and we're down for an hour, an hour out of five days is a long time. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're using the best, the greatest Cisco technology with enough of what we know to be able to troubleshoot quickly, to be able to resolve issues quickly, and to manage the complexity with a team of generally volunteers who come out here, who prep, who really love this stuff, who, who believe it, but also they don't, they're not doing this every day, and they need to be able to be fast and responsive. Well, and I had a chance to talk to some of the, the um, apprentices mm -hmm. that, are, yeah, that have been that. helping with yeah. this, and I think that's fascinating. I love the way we bring up the next generation, give a hands-on in a real live environment that's critical. Yeah. You know, it's a very critical environment. I also love the fact that you choose only Joe Clark would come and say, we need to dial in the right amount of complexity. It's not the way I've always thought of it, but I understand exactly yep. what you're saying there. That works perfect. I'm going to ask you to give up the mic because I okay. want to talk to Absolutely. NetApp, if you don't mind. I'll let you just hand it over to him. Yeah. Perfect, Joe, thank you so thank much, you, I appreciate it. So remind me again, I apologize, what is your name and uh, what are you responsible for here? Yeah, my name is Abhinav. I'm a senior technical marketing engineer from NetApp. And as a NetApp, we have uh, built Metro Cluster. So that is basically your all NOC primary workloads are running. Yeah. So this year we did a technology refresh. So we replaced the controller and we did all the data migration to the new stack. So the entire primary NOC computes are running on NetApp. So, uh, and as you know, that FlexPod, it's a partnership between Cisco and NetApp that has been running since around 2010, almost since the start of Cisco UCS platform. And in FlexPod, we produce validated reference architecture, wherein we call it as Cisco validated design Cisco. and NetApp verified architecture. I've depended on those CVDs in yeah, quite yeah. a few different areas, but you yeah. guys have a lot of variations of that, which I appreciate. That's, that's true, true. So we cover all best practices that comes in building the stack properly and customer can deploy based on the workload requirements. So that's the beauty of that. And we have been done almost 200 plus CVDs. Yeah. So we, we capture all kind of application requirements uh, being with the uh, generic VMware based application or could be a healthcare, AIML and uh, VDI especially. And if you talk about uh, some uh, app modernization, for example, OpenShift. So we cover a large variety of workloads. Okay. Well, I know that you guys have worked with the teams here, and it's the flexibility, the modularity of the, the FlexPod architecture specifically that makes it attractive. But are there any points that you would say, even from a sales standpoint, why, why would someone be interested in, in FlexPod as being the easy-to-use architecture for their compute and data? Yeah, sure. So first of all, it's a data center in a rack, and you will get a lot of flexibility based on you can deploy it on a small or medium business enterprise. And now we can also connect it to the hybrid cloud. So you can move your data across on-prem to the cloud in case of any disaster recovery. And with this, uh, the design of Metro Cluster, both data center are active-active, and they appear as a DR group for each other. So in case even the live uh, uh, Cisco live event is running on the NOC, in case if any of the flex pod or any of the site is getting affected, we can quickly recover the entire stack within five minutes. So that's the beauty of that. So the recovery abilities, it's really the resilience to give you that confidence and the trust that you're gonna be able to yeah. do what you want. Okay, so I'm getting a time check on the studio. We're good to go. I wanna thank you so much for your time and your partnership. Yeah. Guys, we'll head back over to you in the studio now. Thank you. All right, Rob, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Great job, Joe. Great job, uh, Avinav. The Nav, the knock is just, it's so cool. All week long here in Amsterdam, we have been talking about zero trust. Well, yesterday we saw a great iTalk with Lothar Renner and TK Kianini on how to frustrate attackers and not frustrate users using zero trust for the multi-environment IT. 
Well, we are about to replay that session for you right now. We're going to meet you right back here on the other side in Studio A. We're going to roll that VT in just a moment. When we're talking about zero trust, the multi-cloud environment is so interesting. Why? Lack of visibility. We have constantly evolving cyber threats that are the new reality. The perimeter continues to shift constantly, and as hybrid continues to explode and get bigger and bigger and bigger, that perimeter is just going to push out further and create a much larger potential threat surface for us to deal with. Well, this is really where Zero Trust comes into play to make sure that the right people are accessing the right applications, the right capabilities, and the right locations and really do their job in the best way possible. Let's go ahead and roll that VT, and like I said, I'll meet you right back here very shortly. Here we go. Are you good? All right. So thanks for joining in for this innovation talk. What I'd like to start you with is bring back you in time. Things where IT and security was very simple, where you had centralized data centers and control of the user, the device, and the application. You had a very simple security architecture that controlled everything. Fast forward into today's world, that is not longer working. Why? Because your users are working from anywhere with any kind of device from any place. So do you want that your users that you are supporting can access HR applications in a public hotspot? Yes or no? Are you allowing users to work from home? And if so, what are the requirements that you need to control? In the other side, what we have seen is that digitization of entire industries have formed conglom conglomerates of companies working together. Supply chain attacks, when they started early 2014, 15 in Ukraine, we saw that supply chain is a hidden Trojan horse for companies that work together. So if you don't control the infrastructure of your partners and they are connected with you, how do you control their challenges potentially affecting your infrastructure? So suddenly, everyone who is connected is becoming an insider and a potential threat for your organization. We in Cisco, we believe we need a different model, a modern approach to the new environment. We believe that zero trust is the only answer to address the major trends I just spoke about. And we do that in order to achieve what? What we call security resilience or cyber resilience, which means when you're under attack, you are able to survive and even go, come out stronger after the attack. Zero trust. Zero trust is a, a name, it's a word, but what is zero trust? Is it an architecture? Is it a product that you buy off the shelf? What is it? Zero trust means different things for different people, whether it's segmentation, whether it's endpoint security, whether it's uh, zero trust network access, a firewall, or what else. What we believe is zero trust is built on three key principles. And those are, number one, never assume trust. Always verify and only give the least privilege access. It's easier said than done because how do you build an environment where you trust per defi definition no one and no, everything must be recontrolled. So we believe that in the modern world, we need an environment which addresses all the, all the elements of your organization, whether it's the application and the data, independently from where you access it, from your on-prem infrastructure, or on the cloud, and independently where the user is and what kind of device he is using. So we speak about the multi-environment IT where we believe zero trust, the way how we do it in Cisco, is able to achieve it. But how do you do it? How do you do it? There are different ways of implementing zero trust at the end. One way where you make it very difficult for your users to cope with it, because any time they connect, they maybe need to fire up VPN. They need to authenticate every time again. We have done a study last year where users confirmed that every 
well, 25% every day in a week, they were breaching the company security rules because the security rules were so, such a big burden on their productivity that they were able to find ways around. And that's what we don't want. On the other side, if you do weak security, then maybe you have a high productivity, but it doesn't help you either. So we, will, we believe the only way is on the top right. The only way to build high security with maximum productivity, that is how we want to show you today how we do that. And the best way always is not to, talk, to speak from a vendor perspective, but to invite a customer that is also on his journey to zero trust and started to implement. And for that, I'm very excited to have our customer and guest coming on stage, Luigi Vasallo from Saar. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ciao, ciao. Wow, how many people? First of all, how are you doing? Good, good, good. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to be invited by a great company like Cisco and to share my experience. I hope that will be of any interest for these people, these gentlemen here. Luigi, not many might know the Italian market well enough and doesn't, don't know uh, Sara. So give us a little bit more background on your company and your organization. Sure. We are a medium-sized insurance company uh, with a long tradition in Italy. We are part of a larger group, which is Automobile Club Italy. Uh, so we have a very traditional company with a long history in Italy. Um, consolidated market of 1 million customers, 800 million revenues. We have a big network of um, sales agents, captive and independent agents. 1,500 point of presence, and um, it's quite complex business because we are offering any kind of uh, insurance product. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the insurance product, but there are two main categories. Uh, one is uh, life and saving, and the other is pro properties and casualties. Uh, so big complexity and um, a lot of different people, a lot of different roles working for us around the country, like uh, claim assessors, uh, legal, doctors. So a very complex environment of many different people and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and process. So we're here to speak about Zero Trust. So what, what, what was the trigger point for your organization and for you to implement Zero Trust? Yeah, I have to start since uh, 2017 when I joined uh, the company. I had completely different experience and, uh, in telecommunication, media market, and uh, uh, it was my first experience in the financial world. And the, the insurance market is very different because it's regulated, heavily regulated. And um, for some reason, has not been affected by the digital disruption as happened in other markets like telecommunication or media or others. So I found a situation where the company were basically mind frame based. Everything was around the mind frame. Uh, no, no, no services, no digital services for customers, no digital services for, uh, for employees or sales agents. So we decided that um, we needed to be ready eventually for the digital disruption. So we started, we embraced a, a dramatic transformation program and now we are a full cloud company and uh, we are, all our data and application sits on Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud and Salesforce. And you can imagine that when you change dramatically all these things, uh, also the cyber security has to start from beginning because it's a completely different environment. And if you, if you put on top of that, that in the middle we had the pandemic, mm. <laughs> also the people are working from anywhere with any device. So the things is super complicated. Right. So I need to ask you that question. And for sure you heard Cisco live here. Why Cisco and not some yeah. other vendor? So Give yeah. us some insights. Because uh, uh, it's a very, as I said, it's a very complicated uh, problem to solve. You have many different kind of people, many kind of different data sitting on cloud, on personal devices, on manager devices. You have point of presence with our manager, their manager. So it's, it's a massive problem. And uh, I don't have internally all the competencies and the, 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 the skills and the people to, in, to do the integration of many different platforms. When, when, because to have a cyber security solution, you need to have, um, unfortunately, many different kind of software solution. There is no one uh, stop shopping solution. 
And this is why, at least for a great part of this uh, cybersecurity uh, framework, we adopted Cisco, because Cisco can offer solutions in many different uh, domains, like network, uh, device, device uh, protection, threat, uh, um, pre threat identification, uh, cloud monitoring, etc. And we can work using one single point of control, which is mm -hmm. the SecureX console. And this means for us many different benefits. I don't have to spend money and time in doing inter several integration. I am very quick when I need to detect something. I have tools to react. So if, uh, if something wrong is happening, I can isolate immediately an element, maybe a, a laptop or a server. So I make my life a little simple. Okay. <laughs> so with the, so like I'm going to show a little bit what uh, Luigi and his organization has implemented. Like, this little, you spoke a little bit about the outcomes, but like, uh, are you happy with the result and where are you on your journey? Yeah, yeah, we are absolutely, absolutely happy um, because we completed this plan. Uh, which was uh, started on two, after the cloud adoption that was in 2018. It was a one-year program, a crash program. It was not a work in the park. <laughs> it was really a tough uh, year for us. But to give you an idea, one year of crash program and three years of a cybersecurity program. So from 2019 to the end of 2021, we implemented the cybersecurity program, which is uh, made of many different things. Mm -hmm. And um, as of today, we are happy with this because we have many, mm, at least we have um, a complete cybersecurity framework. We think we have uh, a maturity level, which is, uh, I would say, the best possible for us. Uh, of course, it's proportionate to our dimension, to our risk. And uh, because we are not, of course, uh, Ukraine, we, are, we do not manage uh, national security mm. uh, facilities. But however, we have um, a lot of data with, that are interested for, uh, for people. Uh, when you manage life and saving products, you have a lot of information about health, about people. So mm. we, need to be, we need to take care about this data because it's the trust that we have from our customers. So we did everything in our needs. Mm. Uh, and uh, we reached a good maturity level at the moment. And, um, amazing, amazing. Like uh, we are running, uh, running almost out of time. Of you, okay. Of time. However, um, Gardner is stating that almost 50% of companies that are on a zero trust journey will fail. So you are on a successful journey, I would say. Any advice you would give the audience here or live? Uh, um, on the map. Yeah, it's true. It's extremely f simple to fail in a digital transformation project or in a zero trust uh, cybersecurity program. There are a um, few ingredients. Probably we will talk tomorrow in a larger pres longer presentation. Uh, but first of all, you need to have the commitment of your board because it's, an, it's a not an IT program. It's, uh, you have to think that it's not technology. It's a lot of, uh, you need to solve uh, business problem. You need to think about the uh, outcome. What are the business outcomes that you want to achieve? And in order to make that, you need to have the commitment of your board. I asked my CEO to sit together with me, for example, when we have a, a crisis simulation, when we need to simulate an incident response. And if you have this kind of commitment from the board, uh, probably you have a larger chance to be successful. Mm. There are even other ingredients, right. but you need to come to the door. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I know there's more, but uh, I think, uh, thank you, Luigi. Uh, thank you so much. Great story. Thanks for, for coming. Thank so, you. The question is, how can we help you to be successful on your journey? And for that, I invite TK Giannini on stage, our CTO and VP of Architecture from the Security Business Group of Cisco. TK. Thank you. All right. We get to talk about technology. Um, I want to start by saying that, um, you know, Zero Trust gives us the opportunity to carry out a lot of security related objectives, block, block the bad things, essentially what we've been doing. It also, though, gives us an opportunity to um, 
to establish trust explicitly, maybe even cryptographically. And through that, we can get designers to remove the friction of your experience. Um, I know security can be frustrating. This is the opportunity, actually, to raise the friction for the bad guys and to lower the friction for the good guys, okay? So I'll take you through some of the fundamentals. I wanna say that there are sort of four columns or phases to a zero trust journey. One is to establish trust, and I mean at the highest degree. So we're not talking single factor authentication, we're talking multi-factor authentication, and I'll walk you through some innovation actually we're doing in that area. Uh, the other one is once we know who you are and your role, we just grant you just enough privilege to do your job. Okay, that is the least privileged um, principle, and that has been around security for more than 30 years. Okay, we now get to implement that. Why? Because now we have the controls on the network, on the endpoint, we have the controls in the data plane so that the, c the control plane can actually deliver on this entitlement. Now, some of you may actually have known, you know, Cisco uh, maybe even 20 years ago talking about network access control, NAC. Uh, you, it's kind of, it kind of sounds like an old term now. Um, that is not sufficient anymore. Now we have to do continuous trusted access. So it's not just when you log in that we establish trust. At minute five, at minute 10, at minute 15, ongoing, we are checking the device integrity, the user's integrity, and frankly, the application's integrity. And if something goes wrong, we lose, let's say, some level of trust, something brought into question, we have to respond to that change. And I don't care if it's two hours into your you know, WebEx session or, or not, we're gonna make a change. We might ask you to actually re-authenticate. We introduce friction when we lose trust. All right. I have to talk about a little bit of innovation here, so bear with me. To me, I've been in security about 30, 35 years, and security's not about encryption, it's not about firewalls. For me, it's about innovation. I innovate, I, I raise the defense level, the bad people innovate, they send me back to my innovation spiral, and round and round we go. So let's talk a little bit the innovation in, in Zero Trust really comes down to being able to ride that fine line where I really want to make you productive. I really want to get out of the way, okay? But the minute you start looking suspicious, I need to check on things, okay? Because most of what the bad guys are doing, they're, they're not breaking into your network anymore. They're logging into your network and they're becoming you. Right, so again, this ongoing verification of trust is, is very, very important. So when you look at the left-hand side, you know, there's, there's several methods we can innovate on to, um, to check the integrity of who you are or your device. There's lots of signaling that happens on the, the risk side of things. When, when you look a more risky, we're going to actually dial up the authentication. We're gonna make it harder and harder, okay? But when we have the trust, we know it's you. We know nothing's really changed since the last time we checked. We're gonna just push on through, okay? So even, even at the time of authentication, um, we wanna be checking factors, like what has changed since you logged in? There is a um, fingerprinting method that we developed with Wi-Fi, you know, doing GPS can sometimes break a lot of privacy issues. So what we're able to do is take a fingerprint of all the SSIDs and everything, hash them up, and send a, a sort of a differential to the cloud and store this in your profile so that one of two things will happen. One, you'll be sitting there working, uh, your IP address might be changing, but you're still at the same location. I may not bother you. Or your IP is the same and you've actually moved like 700 you know, SSID hashes in, in the, the radio proximity. I'm gonna ask that you re-authenticate. Okay, so the, again, this is how we, we have a risk-based uh, authentication method. We've also introduced uh, 
another factor. I would call it sort of the highest amount of friction. And we only do this because of this new threat, which is it's a Friday. Some attackers got your credential. They just keep on sending you pushes. Okay, you got one of two things to do. You either OK it or deny it. And by, by push number 300, you're like, oh my god, I, I need to make this thing go away. And you hit allow. Okay, that's very, very bad. Okay? So we, we're going to make it impossible for you to do that. I'm going to show you a demo of that. Um, we also have to make it very, very simple for the administrator. There is one or two people probably in your organization that are at the front line of fighting the bad people. Okay? We want to show them exactly what the reason is for this particular risky escalation, and we want to show them how to be actionable to take care of it immediately. So I'm going to show you a quick demo and then get out of the way. All right, let's start the demo. So this is a, a remote user. Uh, let's, let's call her Lee. Her name is Lee. Uh, she's just going to get to work. She's working from a coffee shop. She's going to use password lists, so it's biometric. She needs to get to uh, basically her team drive. She uses her fingerprint. She's successful. She auths in frictionless. She's now working with her files, with her team, no VPN, it's over SMB. So she's happy. I don't know why she's using Notepad, but that's fine. Um, let's say you know, she need, needs now to get to her customers uh, via Salesforce. So uh, again, she goes to uh, the portal. You'll see here, success. We didn't even bother her. We, we have the trust established. Just get to work. So again, high on the priority. Of, of productivity, she gets in, she does her thing, everybody's happy. Now, this is passwordless, this is using trust for the subsequent login, she's happy. She's so happy she goes get coffee. Well, now the bad guy comes in, okay? Now the, the, the hacker has stolen her credentials somehow, okay? Just bear with me here. Um, and the hacker is going to try and get into her account. So. Here, the hacker clicks, log in. Now, mind you, the hacker's coming in from a different device. So all the hacker knows right now is login and password. Okay, and that's not going to be sufficient, but here's what happens. Password gets entered. It's the correct password. So what happens? We know it's not coming from the same device. So we say, oh, we're going to push. So just a simple push, deny, approve. She's like, you know what? I'm getting coffee, and I'm not in uh, that location, I'll report it. So it gets reported. OK, now, hackers are not going to stop there. They're going to they're gonna irritate you. They're going to keep on doing this until you click OK. Now we escalate. Now we have a verified push. That 4840 is not known by Lee. She cannot possibly type in 4840. Only the hacker knows that. OK, so sh she says, oh, still not me. And so suspicious login, boom. You know, hopefully, or hopefully this, this person goes and goes in and attacks somebody else. But that's the demo. I'm going to close by saying that um, a lot of the product portfolio is made up of a lot of different controls. One of them, fundamental, identity. Identity is the new perimeter. OK, but to bring the portfolio together, we actually have to wrap it around a bunch of cloud services. That is the security cloud. The security cloud in a zero trust context, you can kind of think of it as the, the control plane for zero trust. And the data plane might be on the network. It might be the endpoint. It might be Lee's device. But this is sort of how that architecture is, is built. And when Cisco comes to you and hears what your zero trust objectives are, we want to meet you where you are. You might have some of the parts already. You might not have anything. But Again, meeting you where you are with the right technology so that you can get to your outcomes. That's, that's what it's about. All right. That's it for me. I am handing it back to Lothar. Thank you, TK. So what TK was showing was one element of our fabric of the multi-environment IT, focusing on the user and its device. So there's more story behind for the other elements. But as you heard it from Luigi, what are the recipes for success? He spoke about a mature zero trust implementation. 
And we have just recently released a study that has proven with companies that have a mature zero trust implementation, they are quite as successful as others in addressing the key things. Number one, what also Luigi said was executive uh, support and commitment. Number two, the peer buy-in, and last but not least, um, creating a, secure, a security uh, culture. So, what do we have going forward? How do you start? Number one, have a plan. Number two, understand where you are and where you want to go to and create a gap analysis. And last but not least, make sure you draft a roadmap. But I would say this even a fourth one is have first initial success, because when you have first success and first positive results, it's easier for the users to follow. So how do we support you? And for the ones who have not picked up their mobile phone yet, now is the time to make a picture to scan the barcode. Why should you scan the barcode? Not only because you can go to our booth over there in the security area and visit our Zero Trust uh, demo pod, but most importantly, we offer you free workshops on Zero Trust. One is focusing more on the design, another one more on the implementation. The next week, we have two workshops where you can join virtually when you register on the link behind the barcode. And for all the other elements, we have um, a collective, uh, more material on our website. So we believe that we have the ingredients for you to build a strong zero trust implementation. We are happy to support you with all what we have to make you successful, that you are the ones on the right side from the Gardner statement on the 50% that are successful. With that, I wish you a great day and a successful implementation. Thank you for coming. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that a bank doesn't operate like a shipping port, which doesn't operate like a hospital, which doesn't operate like rocket science. So if every business is different, why should they all have the same cloud strategy? Some will tell you to move your data center to the public cloud. Others tell you to bring the public cloud into your data center, when in reality, you just want to operate across both. With Cisco, hybrid cloud means cloud your way. Our solutions are intuitive and flexible, so you can connect and operate with the clouds of your choice when and where you need to. And because they're proactive, they deliver insights that allow teams to see and fix problems before their problems. All so you can build cloud ready, operate cloud smart, and accelerate cloud native. Which may not be rocket science, but it's definitely genius. Wherever curiosity plants a seed in a mind, sprites wildly and then demands to be fed. More, more, more. It's wherever someone asks why, or how, or what's at the bottom of a black hole. 
A classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn. Through secure remote and hybrid learning, Cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom. And we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world. Powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge. There's a difference when your technology really sees you. Hey guys, so I have a new sketch for the upcoming... We mean really sees you. Feedback on, obviously. When your technology adjusts to your needs, whether day or night. That's it. Thank you. When it provides the analytics that keep work working. This is the WebEx Desk Camera. Make your best impression every time. All right, welcome back to the live broadcast. Coming to you from Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. Thanks so much to all of you for tuning in wherever you happen to be in the world, working at home, working at the office, working anywhere that our new hybrid world allows and encourages. Cisco is all in. We are so glad that all of you are as well. My name is Steve Mulcher. We have still got a ton of great content coming at you over the next two and a half hours, right up to and through our closing keynote with Pierre Luigi Colina and Wendy Mars, and that's going to kick off at 5.30 Central European time. So, set those alarms. In just 15 minutes, we are going to head into our IT leadership opening keynote, starting with Fletcher Previn. Fletcher is our new Cisco CIO, and he's going to share his vision and his strategy for the future of IT. But first, we're going to head out to the sustainability zone right down there, where Cedric DeVolder is all abuzz with Beehive Assembly. Hello, Cedric. <laughs> Steve, exactly. I'm here at the sustainability zone and there's such a buzz going on. I'm so happy to be here, right? Um, look, they're clapping because we're here. Um, but yes, no, so I'm here in the sustainab sustainability zone. Uh, it's all about Cisco smart workspaces here. And luckily, I have one of my good B friends with me, Naf, um, who will explain us a little bit more about this. So, Naf, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much. Great. So, we're here at Cisco smart workspaces. What is Cisco Spaces? I mean, Cisco Spaces is our real-time location services platform. Uh, predominantly, we take telemetry from our wireless infrastructure, all of our Cisco customers out there that also have integrations with our WebEx portfolio, as well as our Meraki cameras and IoT services. I mean, here we've got a quick example of our 3D maps. Uh, this is actually our New York office, Pen1. I can walk into our offices, see very quickly in a visual representation of which rooms are available, which rooms are not. I can click on that room. I can quickly see some very quick telemetry like the air quality, the temperature, humidity levels. And I can even go ahead and book that meeting room and it'll be reflected on my calendar too. Great. So we're here. It's all about sustainability at Cisco Live EMEA here in Amsterdam. How is this helping? Like I'm a customer. How is this helping me with my sustainability goals? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the main things that we can do in terms of helping our customers satisfy their sustainability goals is to be able to use dynamic telemetry to trigger actions against some of their uh, environmental uh, controls. So as an example, I know if somebody is in that room in real time. I can take that data and push it to the cloud, and that moves over to a building managers, management system with some of our third-party partners. They can take that data and, for example, turn the lights off, drop the air conditioning system by a few degrees. All of those things across large estates, you can imagine how much that's going to help our sustainability goals. Great, and the cool thing is we talk about hybrid work here as well, so this links in perfectly with our WebEx collaboration platform as well, because all of our products or most of our devices have sensors in them, right? 
Yes, absolutely. And this is an example of one. This is a WebEx board, and it has built-in telemetry sensors. So all the things that you saw here in terms of room temperature, humidity, and more, as well as leverage the cameras to understand not only if somebody is in that room, but how many people are in that room. So I think the final point really to mention is Cisco Spaces is that glue between bringing all of our architectures at Cisco together as a control point, and we have integrations with not only our our architecture, but so many third parties to help our customers create a safe, seamless, and smart workspace. Great, and it seems like there are loads of use cases, right? So of course, we don't have time, unfortunately, to cover all of them because there are loads. But if I want to learn more as a customer about, and see they're clapping for you now, like this was a really great demo. But if you want to know more about Cisco Spaces, where do we go to find out more about the use cases? Yep, so really simple, spaces.cisco.com. Check us out there, lots of information and content. You can reach us to the team directly, and we can help you with this journey. Awesome, great, thank you so much, Nav. That was awesome. Um, so I'm gonna walk to my bee friends um, because they're building bee hotels over here. So I, I wanna know a little bit more about that. So, hey, Millie, how are you? Yeah, well, thank you, you? Yeah, not too bad, enjoying my time here at Cisco Live and I'm excited to know about the beehive, uh, bee vibe, sorry, hotel. So like, let's go into it. Like, sure. what is this about? So we are drawing a connection between sustainable buildings and sustainability. Because bees in nature, they regulate their, their hives, they regulate their spaces. That's exactly what we're doing with Cisco Spaces as well inside employee buildings, making safe, smart workspaces for people. So we've partnered with uh, Bee Vive for manufacturing these bee hotels, and we're going to donate them to a Dutch NGO called Wellbeing. We had to have a goal this week to create 200 bee hotels for solitary bees that are going to be distributed across the Netherlands. And I think we've just about done it. So we're pretty happy, yeah. I mean, I'm a happy bee for sure. But um, so uh, they're laughing at me, but I'm, so, I'm having so much fun here. I'm going to build one myself later on, Millie. So I'm sure you can help me with that as well. But how did you guys come up with starting this initiative? Um, I don't know. It was uh, it was our director Tina that really came up with it, and she's really been the initiator of all of this. But you know, connected to Cisco Spaces, you can find out more about this on our website as well. And we'd be really happy to talk to everyone about it. Great. And then, um, I mean, I'm gonna build one myself right now in just a minute. But I think we can throw it back over to the studio once again to Steve. So Steve, I'm gonna stay a little bit busy here, uh, but I'm sure you're busy there as well. Cedric, bravo, you've pulled out literally every bee trope that there is. Congratulations for hitting every single one of them. I, I think that was brilliant. Thanks as well to, uh, to Millie and to Navid for, for helping us out with that fantastic story over there at Beehive. Um, remember, keep reaching out to us up to the end of the show using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. If you have missed anything throughout our broadcast, you're going to find every bit of it waiting for you in the on-demand library at CiscoLive.com. Now, back on Monday, before the show even opened up, Nish Parker had an opportunity to sit down with Kelly Jones. Kelly is Cisco's chief people officer. Kelly is all about enabling the right people in the right positions. So we really maximize on everybody's skills. Now more than ever, I know we're a technology company, but we've got to focus on our people. So Kelly and Nish talked about upskilling. She talked about filling the talent gap. We're going to roll that VT for you right now, and then I will meet you right back here in a little over five minutes. Here we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Nish Parker, and I'm here with Kelly Jones, our SVP and Chief People Officer. So, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, how are you feeling? Obviously, we're here back at Cisco Live in person. The energy is great. What's it been like for you? It's been so amazing to spend time with our customers and partners. The energy in this event is infectious. Clearly, people are very excited to be back together, and there's a ton of learning going on. It's fun to watch. For sure, for sure. And we get to do that by going around the show floor, right? And getting yeah. to speak to lots of people. So as part of the Cisco Live program this week, we have the IT leadership program for those leaders that really want to take their leadership skills to the next level in the industry. So what would you say are some of the things that you're hearing from customers? I know you're, you've got a session and you're a key part of that track. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Our customers are very interested in what Cisco is doing with regards to sustainability. There's a lot more energy around this topic than I've seen at past Cisco Lives. It's really fascinating. There's also a, a huge effort to understand how to bring together the technology, the people, the space, and the policy side to have a really robust hybrid working environment. I've been spending a lot of time listening to our customers and partners about their strategy, about the Cisco strategy, and how we can help enable full hybrid work in their organizations. And that's obviously the listening side, right, of customers. And I know you and El Kavanaugh Lomas, our VP of people, in, of people and Communities here in EMEA, also had a session as part of the um, IT leadership track. Uh, it's all about hybrid work. So maybe you could tell us a little bit around what was covered in that session, what you would like people to take away around hybrid work. Yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, one of the things that we really grounded in is the fact that the world has changed dramatically over the last three or four years. And when you think about people and what they're looking for in organizations and what they're expecting from organizations, it requires us to take a bit of a step back and rethink some of the classic talent management practices that we may have. So Elle and I spent some time talking about hybrid work, um, how to fully pull together that intersection of people, spaces, and policy and technology to ensure yeah. that you have a strong plan. But we also went deeply into some of the classic areas around attracting talent in a new hybrid world. Uh, we discussed some of the specifics that our data tells us are more and more important to candidates. Obviously, in the year 2025, I think, millennials are going to be 75% of the workforce. So how do we ensure that we're prepared for that in terms of how we're attracting talent? We also spent a lot of time on the people leadership side, because I would argue that nothing has changed more than people leadership over the last few years. Right. Some of the things that we've typically looked for people leaders to do in terms of delivering business results is still very relevant, but now we're also asking them to show up and be compassionate and communicate really well with their employees and ensure that they're connected to their employees. So the landscape for leadership has changed dramatically. So we, we think obsessively about how can we show up and be better people leaders. And then we also talked a little bit about attrition, what our attrition survey at Cisco told us, what we know to be true, what creates um, stickiness and retention with employees in terms of attachment to your brand and to your organization. So it was a fun session. Right, for sure. And you mentioned obviously hybrid work and some of the challenges, you know, around attraction retention. What are some of the things um, that customers would come to, you know, Cisco on in terms of challenges that they're looking to solve with, you know, obviously the technology side of things as well as the people where they really come together? Yeah, there's three really large things that I hear all the time. The first is around inclusion. So how do we create a fully inclusive environment when we know that 99% of the meetings are now hybrid? And so we actually have a really good story to tell in this with our Cisco technology. You know, we were working this way well before the pandemic came. Right. We actually have technology that allows complete inclusion in the meetings with people focus and many of the other dynamics with WebEx. So that comes up a lot. How do we create the right rituals to ensure full participation and inclusion in our meetings? The second thing that people are really tracking is the impact to early in career. People who might have started as a first job out of university at their organization uh, during the pandemic, and how do we ensure that they're getting the right level of tra training and mentorship and connections across the organization? There's concern about that. Right. And then the third thing that always comes up is culture. How do we maintain culture in an organization in a fully hybrid world? So these three things are constantly questions and conversations I'm having with our customers and partners. For sure, and you know, these are times where we have to adapt and we have to learn new ways of leadership and the culture of lots of organizations is changing, right? So I love what you said there, that really helps to ground and help leaders take things to the next level. Um, obviously, we're here at Cisco Live, which some would perhaps say is a technology show. Tell us about the people side of that, because that's really exciting. I mean, we have some sessions here. What else is it that you want people to take away from this technology show around the people side of things? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. We are a little bit of a one-off talking about the people side at a technology show, but one of the things that I would offer is every organization's services and products are an output of the talent that they have in that organization. So ensuring that you take the time to develop a really strong people strategy aligned to your business strategy that is also forward-looking is a critical investment. So in our session, we really tried to kind of bring home that this is valuable time that we spend understanding the human experience and how to align these to our business strategies. Amazing. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for joining me in the studio today. Thank you. All right, fantastic interview, Nish. And our thanks to Kelly Jones, Cisco's Chief People Officer. As we said on the way into this VT segment, I'll say it again on the way back out, this is a human first company. We talk about technology all the time, but anything that we build here at Cisco, it's only valuable 
It's only important if it's actually serving our population. That's all of our Cisco people, that's all of our customers, all of our partners, the world at large. It's all part of positively affecting a billion people by the year 2025. It goes to sustainability, it goes to empowerment, it's all of the things that Kelly was just talking about, and we're so glad that all of you are a part of it. That is what being all in actually means. Now, in just a moment, we're going to head into our IT leadership segment of the conference. Think about what we've already been doing here on this final day of Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. We have created exceptional experiences for digital and human intelligence. We got an introduction to Cisco Emerging Technologies and Incubation Group, a great BU that is doing amazing, amazing work. We checked out Living Life on the Edge, everything from developers to ops. And we talked about hybrid work offers. Where are we now? Where are we headed in the future? So, like I said, right now, we're going to head into the IT leadership opening keynote. The role of IT today, leading with the experience. This features our new Cisco CIO, Fletcher Previn. Every moment that an employee spends struggling with a system, that's a minute that they're not actually doing the work that they were hired to do and the work that they are so passionate about. Well, that is a friction, and it's a friction that IT has a unique responsibility to solve for us. Fletcher Previn is going to look at the unique role and the responsibility of IT in shaping our culture and the employee experience in all of our enterprise organizations. We're going to send it over to Fletcher Previn in just a moment. We'll head into our IT leadership session. Stay with us all the way through the end of the day and our closing keynote with Wendy Mars and the amazing Pierre Luigi Colina. We're so glad to have you with us on the broadcast. Stay all in with us. Here we go right now. All right, good afternoon. Thanks everybody for uh, spending time here today. So uh, what I thought I would do is um, share with you a little bit about how Cisco IT is organized, what our focus and sort of mission is, how we approach d delivering IT, and then some of the things that we've been focused on recently and have delivered and learnings coming out of the past few years and, uh, and um, just kind of share how we do things internally with you. A little bit about me, um, you can see here on the left of, or I think it's the left, yep, I got kind of an early start in IT. I had a love of computers early on and uh, I thought I actually might go into entertainment and spend some time on movie sets and I actually interned at the Conan O'Brien show and the David Letterman show in New York, but in, in college reaffirmed I really wanted to work in tech and uh, got my first job working in um, IT out in Silicon Valley at walmart.com. That picture looks like I worked at a store, but it was the e-commerce. And, uh, and then figured out my real passion in life was middle management at big companies and went to IBM. And um, I worked at IBM for a number of years and eventually became their CIO for four years. And then uh, more recently joined Cisco. And I'm now um, have the pleasure of being CIO at Cisco. So a little bit about um, Cisco just as a company. We are a fairly large organization, about um, 84,000 full-time regular employees, 50,000 or so contractors. So from an IT perspective, we're supporting a global workforce of about 135,000 people doing business in 98 countries in over 370 offices around the globe, uh, generating a little over $50 billion a year of revenue. The IT department at Cisco is about 8,500 or so employees plus contractors. Um, just a couple of statistics, you know, we're managing a fleet of uh, 130,000 laptops, almost 60,000 mobile devices, uh, and you can see some of the numbers here, you know, uh, 166 petabytes of storage, 22,000 telepresence devices. Uh, all the way on the right there, 15,000 plus uh, Cisco desk pros, which you've, if you have not seen, are fantastic devices that are really helping make hybrid work uh, a much more fulsome experience for people. If you're curious on our laptop distribution, I don't know how many people here have that potentially in their portfolio, but we're about 54% Windows PC, 44% Mac, 2% Linux, although there is a higher percentage of BYO Linux. That's something new that we're rolling out more of an official support for, so that'll probably grow a little bit. 
although it's interesting, of, uh, of new hires, the preference is almost 70% max, so we'll probably see that number shift over time. Um, about 58,000 plus mobile devices under management. The large majority of those are iOS, uh, although we do support choice, and so there's 22% uh, of those are Android. This is how uh, my organization is, is carved up. Um, you know, you can see sort of each one of those wedges of this circle represents a direct report to me responsible for some area of the IT puzzle. So, um, you know, you can see you, you've got infrastructure, workplace as a service, which is generally like the employee IT space, uh, all, of, all things Salesforce, HR and legal, security, commerce, which would include, uh, you know, Oracle, SAP, things like that. Um, um, enterprise architecture, and then uh, supply chain IT, including uh, how we bring new products into catalog and, and put them in our distribution channels and so on. So this is our mission statement. We deliver the technology that powers Cisco. It's um, you know a little bit of a um, unique situation being uh, delivering IT in an IT company. But one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about is um, IT as a very significant factor in determining the answer, what is it like to work here? You know, IT ends up having an outsized role in um, culture change and the impact it has on people's day-to-day -day lives. And so we've embraced this as our motto, which is the, uh, the state of IT, or you could say the quality of IT, is a daily reflection of what the company thinks and feels about its people. And so if we really believe that to be true, then how well we're doing our jobs in IT is not trivial. It's actually sort of core to a culture of high performance and communicating back to employees that we actually value their time and we care about the experience that they're having. And so, you know, it's, I think when I first started work, there was probably like an assumption that things at work are just not as good as things in your personal life because it's a company and things are complicated. New people coming to work, um, you know, people who started five years ago, even three years ago, have a very different set of expectations and their view is, you know who I am, you know what my job is, and you have billions of dollars to spend on this problem. So it should actually be way better than my personal life. And when, you know, when did it become okay to have this terrible experience at work and this great experience at home? And, and the answer is it really isn't. There's just less and less tolerance for that going forward. So we also spend a lot of time trying to engineer from the end user out or from the, you know, lead with the experience as opposed to lead engineering from the IT department out. And one of the ways we try to think about this when we're setting our priorities and allocating budget is with this IT pyramid of pain, which is sort of a tongue-in-cheek thing of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you have to build fire and shelter before you worry about higher order problems. And sometimes in IT, it's very easy to get, you know, completely consumed with some big ERP transformation or some big complex project. Uh, but if the basics are neglected, if the network is insufficient, if the Wi-Fi in the building is bad, if the help desk is not good, if you're provisioning cheap devices, you know, those are the sorts of quality of life issues that lead people to believe the whole function is just poorly run. And then it's very difficult to get the credibility that you need to do larger, more complex, transformative stuff that helps propel the company forward, which then leads to shadow IT and all kinds of other problems. So one of the... Um, first changes that I made when I became CIO was um, creating a design function as a direct report to me in the IT department, which was not something that we had before, but this whole approach of sort of leading with design, and I'll talk more about what that means in a minute, um, and having it as a central function that reports to me is a new thing. And when I say design, well, I, I have a chart on it, so I'll, uh, but it means more than visual design. Oh, here, yeah. So it's the full life cycle of design, right? Research, analytics, content, UI, UX, and visual design. And so, you know, I put this chart together to try to sort of express the, the gearbox that we're trying to build in IT, which is anything that a lot of people are gonna see, um, a mobile app, an enterprise application, a website, 
an email that goes out to the company, a sign that we hang up in the building, uh, anything that a lot of people will experience. I want to try to make sure that it goes through this design team as part of the build process so that it comes out the other end looking like something from your consumer life and not like, you know, CLI output or something. You know, the, I, I work in IT and I get all kinds of messages where even I don't know what it means, so I can only imagine what end users think. And so um, I act as the product owner for the design team and refine the backlog with them to make decisions about where that team's time is most effectively spent. And so you can see sort of on the, so the gearbox is supposed to represent the different types of design uh, skills that are in that design team. To the left of that, we get requirements that sometimes we're our own product owner for. You know, like there's nobody in the business giving us requirements for laptop management or the phone system. But then there are other things that we get from the business around sales transformation or, um, or HRIT or you know, take your pick, anything that you would get from um, other parts of the company. And then assign somebody from the design team or people from the design team to be persistently involved in that project until it's delivered. And what comes out the other end on the output is some sort of an experience, which is the result of what all employees are experiencing plus whatever that particular um, persona-based experience is, and then collecting feedback through NPS and um, creating this sort of virtuous loop of improvement that's informed by research and net promoter score and what users are telling us and user research and so on. And that was just a new thing that we had not uh, done in the past, and I'm a big believer that that has a huge impact on the quality of, of what we deliver and actually goes a long way to kind of reframe our relationship with employees as a kind of servant thing that we're doing. Uh, we have really embraced Agile as a way of working and um, formed all of our um, 8,500 people into Agile teams of six to 10 people. They report to, you know, groups of Agile teams are called components. Groups of components are called a component family. So a component family might be um, Salesforce or something. And then a domain leader, all of my direct reports are domain leaders. And so you can see that this is a different representation of that wheel that you saw before. Uh, this is kind of how we've organized into Agile teams. And part of that work was forming productive Agile teams of um, you know, developers, testers, a product owner, a scrum master or a scrum lead, maybe a subject matter expert, depending on the kind of thing they're working on, and maybe a designer that's assigned to that work. But the goal is to create kind of functionally aligned end-to-end -end teams of people that have as, as much as they need as possible to be able to build something and put it into production with as few dependencies on other people as possible, with the exception of design, which I hold as a centralized function. The goal we set for ourselves is to get double the throughput in half the cycle time. And the reason for that is, you know, it's just, uh, you don't make really significant progress on something unless you set a very ambitious goal that you can't achieve just by making changes at the margins. You have to really fundamentally do some things differently. So really getting after Agile, really leading with design. And so if our goal is double the throughput in half the cycle time, how are we gonna do that? The three hills that we're taking over the, you know, the next year uh, and, and have been working on is talent and culture. That's all about upskilling, being excellent at our craft. Ways of working is all about forming these Agile teams, working in Agile ways. And by the way, we've really standardized on Scrum uh, for the most part, or Kanban if it's more ticket or task-oriented work. And then technology, building with loosely coupled, tightly aligned cloud technology and shifting le left in our, in our build process for improved security. Those are the three main pillars of the strategy. And the way we've implemented Agile, uh, you've got the 12 Agile principles that are well known here in the center, but it's bookended on either side by actual hardline organizational reporting changes and uh, a set of tools and KPIs and things that we're measuring. You know, what you measure is what improves. This is a, um, I've taken real data out of it. Usually it has numbers and dollars and things in it, but it's otherwise correct in terms of we're measuring throughput, in other words, numbers of stories, velocity, number of story points, cycle time, 
number of defects, mean time to recover from things, how many deployments are we putting into production. It's not necessarily that you would want to deploy every single day into production depending on the system, but if you can, you've solved a whole bunch of technical problems, and so that's a goal for the team. Um, we review this monthly with each of my direct reports, and it allows us to have really meaningful conversations about, well, what is behind that? Which Agile team is struggling? How do we help them? So, you know, the other thing I just wanted to share a little bit about is, is the journey over the past few years where I, I think that we've kind of experienced the last couple years in these three distinct phases. Initially, it was very technology focused. Are we going to be able to operate the business with everybody working remotely? Do we have enough VPN capacity? Can we actually close the quarter? We've never really done this before. How do we get more VPN capacity in this region or that region? As soon as it looked like that, you know, things, people had a handle on that, um, the focus sort of turned to, well, what are the consequences of this now? Because it turns out this is going to be a long-term arrangement. Uh, and so if we have now people connecting to our network, potentially using Xbox and smart thermostats and things on the same network, what do we need to do to secure the endpoints and uh, shore up the way that we're kind of approaching cyber in a, in a hybrid world? And then you're never really done with that, but once a certain amount of that we felt comfortable with, uh, you get into the phase that we're in now, which is this culture phase. You know, what, what, are, what does it mean in terms of mission and purpose and sense of togetherness and, and how we operate as a team uh, when at any given meeting, you know, 95% of the time, one or, or multiple people are not going to be in the office. It's going to be a hybrid way of working going forward. And it was actually a simpler problem to solve when everybody was remote, because in a way that sort of leveled the playing field. But having some people in the office, some people on the road, and some people at home is a much more complex IT problem to solve. And if you think about employee well-being, um, you know, you could sort of describe it in four quadrants of, of mental safety, financial well-being, physical well-being, and productivity. And in IT, we really play mostly in the productivity space. But hybrid work done well is about much more than the meeting experience. Think about the end-to-end -end set of problems that we need to be responsible for. You've got the transport, the remote access, the um, observability across networks that you don't manage, your SD-WAN strategy, your peering strategy, um, hopefully split tunnel VPN so you're not having to backhaul all that traffic into the corporate environment to inspect it. Whatever's going on in people's homes with their own network and Wi-Fi, uh, the, um, the applications that they're using, what's the performance of the internet backbone? If Salesforce or Workday or ServiceNow or any of these big platforms people are using, how do you really know what the experience that someone is going to have at home is going to be like? And that's a much more complicated problem to solve. Oh, and zero trust. Um, you know, ideally over time, working it out where less and less of the VPN is actually required. This, by the way, is um, Cisco's global backbone, um, CapNet, and you can kind of see not a lot of one gig links left, but um, you know, the um, the pop strategy when when the pandemic hit, you're going to hear more detail about this from Depeche, who's presenting to you right after me. But building out these points of pre presence, um, having a peering strategy uh, where we peer with people that are equally incentivized to keep traffic off of the internet for settlement-free peering between our organizations, being able to have pops that are closer to where people are using applications, having an SD-WAN strategy that makes sense, um, how you're handling BGP potentially. But what this chart is showing is the, the backbone mapped to where these cloud ports, AKA POPs are, and the services that are being provided there. And just real quick, I won't, Depeche will do a, a, a deeper dive on this, but you can see the stack of hardware on the right and the services that are being provided in all these points of presence on the left. Um, and so that was something that I think everybody knew was important before everybody was working in a hybrid way but it quickly became an existential requirement um, to have a good strategy on this and be executing it. You probably read about companies that sent people home 
and then their network was completely consumed with people watching videos and things online, and that, that's an artifact of all traffic coming over the internet back into the corporate headquarters, and, and uh, probably not ideal. Zero Trust, uh, in our case, we've enabled about 300 applications for Zero Trust so that as a general statement for your average productivity user, a person doing email and messaging and meetings, checking the intranet, um, they really don't need to be on the VPN. Behaviorally, it's taking time for people to learn that, but uh, m most of the apps that are used by the general population are now uh, available without the VPN. And so the goal of all of this was, okay, so if we understand sort of the end-to-end -end set of challenges that are required to deliver a thoughtful hybrid work program to our people, such that a person is not disadvantaged in any way in their career, but just because they don't happen to be in the office. And you don't want to have an experience where there's people in a conference room and they're sort of laughing at an inside joke and whispering to each other, and then somebody is remote, struggling to hear, and can't really read body language, can't tell when they're losing the attention of the person that they're having the meeting with, can't read nonverbal cues, right? That, that would sort of create a, a disadvantage for remote users. And so, you know, the whole sort of set of, of things that need to be solved from ordering uh, equipment for people, communicating with employees, getting zero touch cloud-based provisioning of equipment, uh, proactive monitoring of what is going on with our hybrid workforce. Do we really understand what the experience that they're having is? What kind of telemetry do we need to, connect, uh, to collect to do that? Um, and then providing uh, the right support services uh, for folks and then figuring out what do we do at the end of that cycle two or three years in or whatever, however long it's been uh, when it's time to either dispose of things or renew it or get new ones. And so I have the great luxury of um, being in IT at Cisco and being able to kind of rummage through the catalog of stuff and say, uh, all right, well, what, is, what do I think is the best way to solve this problem meaningfully for employees? and put that stuff together and create a kind of highly integrated experience for people uh, where we've really thought about the design and the packaging and the provisioning and the communications and everything that goes around with it and say, this particular version of the bundle is showing a wireless access point, a Meraki MX appliance, uh, noise canceling headphones, a WebEx camera, a large monitor, a laptop, an external keyboard and trackpad, uh, a cellular backup gateway, and that, that one is the MG21 that has the two antennas on it, or antennae, and um, even in places that have reliable high-speed internet, we were surprised how many people reported uh, occasionally having ISP disruptions. And, the, and so bundling all of this together, oh, and if it's a new employee, the employee badge, um, uh, that's kind of an important cultural part of the onboarding. And then running uh, uh, underneath all of that, our productivity software, our security software, uh, our, our monitoring and observability stuff, things like Thousand Eyes, AnyConnect, uh, Cisco Secure Endpoint, Meraki. And we did a lot of work to sort of create this wow factor for what we send to people at home and uh, designed this box. The whole thing is recyclable. You can save parts of the box and use it as the background in your home office. Um, different layers of the box have history of the company and uh, information about the products that are in the bundle, but also how to set it up and where to get help. Each tray is sort of organized by you know, your laptop, your uh, networking stack, your productivity stuff. Actually, I think that, yeah, here's an, an example of what one of the trays looks like, kind of opened up. And it's early days, so you know, uh, this is a bit of a TBD, and it's probably a little early to be showing data like this, and everyone's home is unique, and it's very hard to draw kind of concrete conclusions from this, so I'm just putting a lot of caveats on it. But of the people that we have equipped with this Cisco Hybrid Worker Bundle, the data tells us that the performance is measurably better in significant ways of the Cisco equipment in their home versus whatever they had before. In this case, you're seeing latency from the local gateway, DNS lookup times, packet loss, 
uh, jitter, you know, all of that's going to translate to uh, better meeting experience, fewer dropped frames, faster lookup times on things, you know, just throughout the day having a better, more reliable, more fulsome experience in the meetings and in the, and, and the work people are doing. Oh, yeah, I didn't really explain it, but the top, the top row uh, in dark blue is the measure of what was the performance before putting in the equipment, so with just whatever people had in their home, and it could have been a bunch of different things, but it was consumer equipment. And then the light blue graph is showing um, the same measurement after installing the Cisco Hybrid Worker Bundles. It's also interesting, uh, we saw increased use of video for people that we had equipped the right way at home. 17% more likely to turn on video in a meeting. Uh, we also saw less attrition in the population of people that had received a hybrid worker bundle compared to a control group of just the regular population. So you gotta be careful about cause and effect, but there's a lot of corroboration that sort of says giving people the right equipment had a significant impact on how they perceived the work experience. We also rolled out a new um, Mac program at Cisco, and this was all about supporting the latest devices, Apple Silicon, managing those devices in a modern way, you know, cloud-based one-touch provisioning. The instructions are step one, take it out of the box. Step two, turn it on. Step three, there is no step three because it's DEP enrolled, connects over the cloud to the MDM, and then automatically goes through all of, all of the things that we used to do in an image. And uh, if we do those first two things correctly, we can then afford to create a help desk that's totally incentivized on a great experience for people. And actually, that, that picture on the right is the, uh, the, the beginnings of the new dedicated Mac help desk that we have created. Uh, and it is interesting, like when the program is set up right and, and you give people the kind of device that they want, you get good results. In our case, um, you know, people who chose Mac were three times less likely to call the help desk when setting up their device compared to PC users. This is the hybrid work operation center that we're building right now in San Jose, California in the US. This will be a um, staffed location where we collect all of the te telemetry uh, and monitoring from our employees that have hybrid worker bundles, where ideally we can proactively detect an issue before they're even aware that something is going on. You know, poor Wi-Fi signal, you're too far from the wireless access point, or we're detecting you know, a flapping circuit somewhere from your ISP, uh, you know, whatever the issue is. And um, um, we'll really be able to know what the kind of application level performance that people are experiencing in their remote work environment is um, by being able to get a lot of this observability, as I said before, even across networks that we're not responsible for and we don't manage, like the public internet backbone. This is something we've started to do as part of the return to office experience. It's called the, uh, the Help Zone kiosk. And the idea is, um, yeah, I have another picture, there we go. That you can walk up to it, um, get support. When you walk into that little room, you're connected via WebEx on a desk pro to a support person. If we can't fix the problem on the phone, uh, we can remotely swing open one of those lockers and issue a replacement laptop. Or you can swipe your badge. Oh, here's a person getting support. Uh, you can swipe your badge on the kiosk and uh, we bill your department and you can purchase accessories, uh, keyboards, power adapters, uh, but also PPE, masks and things like that for being in the office. Which, um, speaking of the office, you know, a big part of, um, there have been a lot of discussions about what is the role of the office going forward and how do we make the office uh, a magnet, not a mandate? Um, you know, how do we make the office a place that people want to go? And I think part of that is the office for a lot of people is likely not a place that you're gonna go to do eight hours of individual work anymore, but it's gonna be a place where we occasionally gather for some purpose. And, um, and so there's a whole 
Cisco approach to this around the intelligent workplace of the future and smart buildings, and you're gonna hear more about this from other speakers, but at a high level, you know, being able to collect data from the cameras, the wireless access points, air quality sensors, occupancy sensors, uh, the WebEx devices that are in the facility, uh, and Cisco's DNA center allows us to then put a picture together of what is happening in that location, whether it's uh, how to quickly get to the conference room that you're trying to get to or the place that you're trying to get to, what's the air quality, what's the occupancy level, um, you know, all this kind of information that is extremely helpful when you go to an office. So as we then start to refurbish our offices and turn them into kind of cultural centers and places for collaboration rather than individual workplaces, and you'll still have some, some places for individual work because people occasionally do need that, but for the most part, the data is pretty clear that the reason people want to come to the office is to be with other people. And so it just requires a different kind of a layout and a different approach to the office. This happens to be our, our new uh, Cisco office in Raleigh, North Carolina in the US. Here is uh, the new office in, in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. So, um, you know, as I get ready to wrap up, and by the way, I think, um, I should have mentioned in the beginning, but I, I think we're, we're set up for WebEx questions, is that true? Yeah, yeah. So if anybody has questions, go ahead and feel free to post them in the, uh, in the WebEx channel. But, um, you know, leading with the employee experience has been a, a really significant part of um, our renewed strategy for IT, both in terms of how we reframe our relationship with employees, position ourselves as a very servant function. You know, we serve those who serve others. Our purpose is to enable everybody at Cisco to do the best work of their lives. And to do that, we have to take very seriously how much friction is in the system. Every minute that people spend struggling with some IT system or trying to complete a task is a minute taken away from doing the thing that they were hired to do and the thing that they feel fulfilled doing. And so these experiences are important. And, and you know, if it's death by a thousand paper cuts, uh, IT plays a, a really significant role in determining the culture of a place and the answer to what it's like to work at this organization. Number two, uh, prioritize network modernization. I mean, everybody in this room probably knows that's important, but um, the network of today looks very different than the network of a few years ago. The home is now a branch office. It's a much more porous, much more distributed network. There are cybersecurity implications of that. There are SD-WAN implications of that. There's VPN implications and zero trust implications that need to be uh, tackled or, or you'll end up you know, being held back by the network, which um, everything really starts with the network. You know, all, all these things people are using, SaaS tools uh, and everything else. If, if your network is not set up for it, it'll be a, a, a real uphill climb. Uh, three, deliver a great hybrid program. I mean, I think at some point we're probably going to stop calling it hybrid work and it'll just be called work because that's the way everybody's working. But a really thoughtful end-to-end -end set of capabilities to enable people to have an equal experience no matter where they are in the world um, is more complicated than I think it sounds. It, it's much more significant than what you're using for meetings. It's all of the things that we talked about. Embrace agility. Um, all of us have more work than we have people to get done. And so um, Agile has been a force multiplier for us in terms of being able to move more work through our backlog to a higher level of quality with fewer defects, fewer audit findings, fewer compliance issues, automating and reusing. Um, you know, by definition, when you reuse something, it's already been through all of the testing and automation. And then the last thing, I, you know, my recommendation is um, to position IT as a transformation engine. IT is really the, the delivery engine of whatever transformation your company is trying to affect. And so, um, rather than thinking of it as a cost center that you wish you didn't have, if we get IT really running right, I, I do think you know, people start to think of it differently and think it's great news when IT is working on a project because it means it's gonna get done and it's gonna be compliant and it's gonna be secure. Um, 
but it is a bit of a different sort of philosophy and approach. And so with that, I think if we have any questions. Yes, we do, Fletcher. We've got uh, one question from the audience. Um, how is Cisco IT embracing innovation in a world where the home is the branch office and people are working more and more from home? Well, good question. Um, well, as I said, first of all, I have the, the luxurious position of, of being at Cisco, which means I can bring all Cisco technology to bear to help solve this problem. And a lot of the piece parts of, of, uh, of the innovation that's required are networking in nature, actually, or security in nature. And so I, I have actually a very broad portfolio to draw from. But um, you know, I, I think the hybrid worker bundle has been a significant milestone towards doing that. Um, being able to monitor and measure and move from reactive to support to proactive support is probably a big piece of that. And then um, being thoughtful sort of about the environment that people are working in. There's a big difference between maybe the way that I'm having a, a meeting from home and somebody else who is in a crowded kitchen with young kids running around and doesn't have a space to work from home that's quiet. Things like noise canceling, virtual backgrounds. Um, you know, there's a set of technical things that are innovations that become incredibly important to people to help overcome some of those environmental challenges. For example, uh, if you're in a meeting where some people are in a conference room and some people are remote, you don't really want everyone who's remote to just see this big wide shot of the conference room with 15 people sitting around the table. And so one of the new things that, uh, in our case, WebEx does is it will chop up the, the conference room and show each of the participants in their own square so that everybody has the same sort of view of each person in the meeting. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, I, the, the noise canceling has been incredibly helpful. Um, being able to optimize just for your voice is another version of noise canceling that's been very helpful. So I think we're right on the precipice, actually, of a lot of really interesting innovation in this space. Um, but the, the combination of the technology and the culture and then just the social norms, you know, we kind of know what it's like to work in an office. I think working from home has been a challenge um, culturally for organizations to, to quite get right. You know, there are days where I don't have enough time to get up from my desk and go to the bathroom, and I'm at home. Being busy is not the same thing as being productive. And so how do we carve out time in the day to have time for thought, to have time to have unscheduled conversations with people, and to retain some of the, the magic that happens when you're in an office together, even if you don't happen to be in the same office? OK, um, just uh, another question here, Fletcher. Um, how do you deal with the employee's desire for non-Cisco competing high-quality goods, both hardware and software? For example, AirPods, Google Meets, Miro, et cetera. Uh, competing, good. Why would anybody want competing equipment than Cisco? There's no such thing as competing high-quality products. Well, Apple doesn't make AirPort anymore, so that solves that one. What were the other ones on the list? Uh, Google Meet. Google Meet. OK, well, so all joking aside, um, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, different tools that are in use within Cisco. And it's been less of a mandate of you have to use this stuff and much more of a we believe this provides the best experience for people. And, uh, and, and generally speaking, our approach is, is more, um, I don't know if this expression translates, but it's more carrot than stick. You know, if you, if you make it best in class to use this, then there's very little reason for somebody to use that. Uh, but what's often behind some of those things, when you go and talk to people about specifically why do they want to use a different tool, it doesn't have to be competing even, by the way. You might have standardized on one tool, and then somebody you find is using a different tool. They don't generally do that because they want to introduce a bunch of risk into the environment. They do it because they think it's providing something to them that the tool that you've provided doesn't provide. And so rather than just shut that down, what we try to do is go and have a conversation about what is it that you like about this tool, what is it that it's providing, and then figure out how we can do the same thing within the tools that we're providing. But you know, it, 
if you just let everything crop up in the environment, very soon you get feedback from other users that say there are too many tools in this environment. I don't know which thing I'm supposed to use for which meeting, I, and therefore I have to have everything all the time and it's overwhelming. And so it's, it's, it's a balance of ease of use and simplicity and having a, a clearly articulated point of view on how work gets done versus allowing employee choice and not stifling creativity. We, by the way, allow everybody to be a local admin, so they can install, you know, for the most part, whatever they want. Uh, but we have to provide a, um, here's the Cisco IT view on how we think work is best achieved at the company. And we have to do that well enough that people vol voluntarily want to do that. Unless there's some security risk or something that we have to, we have to stop. Yeah, and just to add, we do have Miro, uh, so our employees do use Miro. It's, it's oh yeah, what were the other ones on there? Airport, Miro? Uh, that was all, yeah. Okay. So your Google Meet, AirPods. Well, Miro is not competing. No. It's a whiteboarding tool and we, we use it. So a uh, lighthearted question, I think we got time for maybe a couple more. Um, how often do you personally work from home? Oh, good question. Um, you know, it's, it's not even. I might work from home for two to three weeks in a row and then I might be traveling and not home for weeks in a row. But as a general rule, I would say I work from home about 50% of the time, give or take. I don't know, I haven't really worked it out, that's just a guess. And, and um, I, I, probably the final question, this is quite a good question here as well, it's like how do you deal with the challenge of support ability for an enterprise network with dispersed hybrid teams, managing major incidents and changes, et cetera? Okay, well, um, as you would imagine, Cisco has a very robust, very mature incident response um, plan and playbook for, for anything that might occur, both for customers on the tech side of the house, uh, as well as for ourselves internally. And so, um, you know, we have teams that work 24 seven and uh, Knox that kind of follow the sun, S uh, security operations centers as well. Um, and when an incident comes in, uh, if it gets escalated to a certain level of criticality, um, it gets worked on you know, 24 by seven until it's resolved. And depending how severe it is, um, the management team might be getting updates on it every hour until it's resolved. Uh, but um, just being distributed in different time zones is not really a hindrance to that. Actually, sometimes it helps because um, you know, we'll have teams in, in AP, teams in Europe, teams in the US, um, and, and, and have 24 by seven coverage. On the commercial side, it's a, a, a bit of a different answer how Cisco TAC handles things, but they, they do that for a living all day long. Okay, I, I, I know there was a last question, but there's one more, we've got three minutes left. Um, is Cisco IT the first testing ground for any newly developed technology product within Cisco? Yes, it is, excellent question. Um, we, uh, we drink our own champagne or eat our, eat our, it's better than eat our own dog food, but um, we, um, we look like a lot of the customers that Cisco is hoping to sell to. So if it works for us, um, you know, that's a good indicator that it's going to work for a lot of customers. Um, you know, everybody believes they're unique in some way and we're probably, we think we're a little bit unique in some ways, but we're a large enterprise and a lot of Cisco's customers are large enterprises, and so there's a lot of value in having this partnership with the, um, the business units within Cisco that are developing the, the product side of the house. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we are, we're, we're customer zero on um, all kinds of things. Actually, when, when Kieran and Depeche are out later, they can probably give you some specific examples of, of areas where, um, We've been customer zero before something was even a product that could have a customer to help them figure out kind of what exactly does this product do and what feature sets are useful and what deficiencies would it have. So yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, that's all, that's all for Q&A. Uh, if you'd like to, please continue to post your questions in the WebEx space and uh, you know, I'm sure Fletcher or someone from his team will, will respond. Give it up for Fletcher Previn. Thank, Thank you much. for that keynote. Hard work has its place, but when it comes to managing your network, you want to work smarter, not harder. 
You want to accomplish more and stress less. That's where the next generation AI-powered Cisco DNA Center comes in. It simplifies operations through automation and shortens response times. So tasks that took days are done in minutes and sometimes don't need to be done at all. With Cisco DNA Center, you'll have the superpower of teleportation to virtually see and adjust your wireless coverage in any space in your network. You'll have AI-driven security to classify endpoints and enforce security policies across domains. And you'll be seamlessly integrated into the broader Cisco ecosystem for an unparalleled end-to-end -end network management solution, which means you'll spend less time worrying about your network and more time innovating. to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. Welcome back from your break. I hope you enjoyed it. Next up, I'm really excited to invite Mike Shack onto the stage. He's the director for Cisco's security, visibility, and incident command team. He's responsible for monitoring, investigating, and mitigating all of, C all of Cisco's computer security, data loss, and privacy events at Cisco. Please join me in welcoming Mike to the stage. Thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone for being here. As mentioned, I'm Mike Sheck. Uh, I've been at Cisco for a little while. I actually started uh, when I was in my uh, youth and have been there for about 20 years. And most of that time I've spent in a traditional incident response organization doing you know, detection and investigation and mitigation of all the kind of threat actors and all that sort of fun stuff. And so much of my career was fairly technical, doing threat intelligence as well and, and having a lot of fun there. And uh, I, I never really wanted to be a manager. You know, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room that ended up being in the IT management tracks without clear intentions. Um, I always had lots of friends that were like, I want to be a manager. And, and that just didn't really sound like you know, like at the time, something that made a lot of sense to me. And it wasn't until many years ago my boss left and uh, everyone we kept interviewing was just not very good. <laughs> and I said like, well, let me try and ended up kind of accidentally loving it and not expecting it and finding that the problems that we get to solve as managers can be every bit as technical and often far more complex than the real technical problems you have as an individual contributor. So I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you know, folks in similar positions um, at other companies that have to solve all these problems on a regular basis. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is a little bit about our approach to zero trust at Cisco, some of the reasons we went down that path and the problems we were solving and some of the lessons that we've learned. And so we'll start off really looking at the industry in general and talking about like what problems are out there, why our zero trust approach was appealing from a security perspective, 
And then looking at some of the, the issues that we ran into at the start of that journey and why, <laughs> why we had to make a lot of critical decisions that could have gone you know, many different directions and, and where we ended up and what that approach actually looks like. And then at the end, some of the, the key takeaways from that journey. Um, so starting off, again, looking at the industry, we look at reports like the Verizon data breach reports, a really good one, but there's many other uh, publications out there that kind of give us some insight into what's happening in the world. And a lot of times, you know, this is also stuff that, that matches very closely with the experiences we see fighting some of these fires every day. So, you know, the, the team that I'm running now is still responsible for incident response and detection and, and mitigation, but there's also, you know, policy and, and architecture and all sorts of other fun stuff. And we partner real closely with our IT team to make sure that we can develop security solutions that work both for IT and work for the InfoSec organization. So I fall under the chief security officer. Um, but you'll notice right away, targeting identity is something that we're seeing more and more of. And it's not just Cisco. This is, again, Verizon Data Breach Report. I think you'll see it on a regular basis in places like Krebs. Um, not a surprise for anyone, is my guess. This isn't anything new. Bad guys want your usernames and passwords. What's interesting about it is there are creative ways that the bad guys are using some of this information that are, are leading to some results that aren't always things that we expect. And, you know, an example, and so Cisco published a blog in August about an incident that we had where some attackers actually found information uh, with some malware that was actually pulling usernames and passwords out of Google Chrome cache. And they, they had some passwords that belonged to some of our employees. Well, that's not a big deal. They shouldn't be using the same passwords for external websites as they're using internal, and we should have strong passwords and you know, all that sort of stuff. And most importantly, we've got MFA. Well, I think what we're finding is about 10% of our workforce, if they receive an MFA push on their phone, they just they hit OK. Even if they didn't initiate it, even if it's the middle of the night and they're woken up at 2 a.m. and they pick up their phone bleary-eyed and they just like mash some buttons and go back to sleep and they may have just allowed someone access to the corporate network by hitting OK. So this isn't something that we really knew about and understood well before this happened, uh, but you know, now we understand a, a, a lot more that there's real impact to having credentials exposed. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is people are actually going out and finding credentials in these large dumps, and they're taking the username and password combinations and trying them against identity stores for applications that aren't even related to the one that they're looking at. And so they're finding, you know, Mike Sheck at Cisco.com, and they're trying that, you know, against O365 and against Salesforce.com because often the way all of this identity integration works is people are using the usernames and passwords and an identity provider for single sign-on at their company that's completely disconnected from the actual resource that they're authenticating to. And so, you know, you may look at your, your username and password that's exposed and, and not think that it's a big deal, but taking some time to actually look and figure out where the identity is, is used can be huge. And so we'll talk about some of the things that, that help mitigate that risk a little bit. Um, targeting applications. 54% uh, of web applications have vulnerabilities where there's actually an exploit out there. So, you know, that's a huge deal. Um, between 2017 and 2018, targeted malware for IoT devices went up 300%. And so, you know, you might not think that someone accessing your light bulb is a big deal, but it presents a lot of interesting scenarios where maybe there's a low power radio in that light bulb with a vulnerability and someone with proximity can run an exploit against it and now has access to your wireless network, which has really strong authentication otherwise, but everything is proxied through this light bulb. 
And so just the attack surface and the complexity of this is really starting to evolve. So really interesting time to be, you know, playing the security game and seeing the bad guys getting creative and figuring out what we can do to be creative in our solutions. One of the more disturbing pieces, and this probably isn't a surprise to a lot of the folks in the room that are security folks. So just out of curiosity, hands up, how many people here would say security is the majority of the work that they do? A good chunk. Now, how many people have some security responsibilities, but maybe it's not majority? So the majority seem to fall into that bucket, and that isn't surprising. Anyone that just no security responsibilities whatsoever? A couple of folks? Yeah. Many people that spend a lot of time doing security for a living know that there are way more vulnerabilities than we have time to patch. It's just the reality of the world we live in today. The fact that 99% of the vulnerabilities exploited have been known for over a year by the staff that's responsible for patching, it's a little scary. It tells you that, that we have a problem prioritizing vulnerabilities and figuring out where we need to patch and where we can let things slide. Because if they're actively being exploited, we're not doing a very good job. So what do we do? Given some of that context, how did we actually begin down the zero trust path? Well, if we rewind before COVID, if anyone remembers what that was like, and it is amazing to be here with a bunch of people in the same room, actually at a conference. It's been years for me since I've been able to stand up here and, and talk to folks. Um, but if you remember before COVID, we were having conversations about user experience and about what a pain it was to have to VPN in, and what a pain it was to have to use multiple passwords for all the different applications, even inside of our enterprise. We might have an identity store for you know, a specific group within IT, and then some of our service offerings might have another identity store, and then maybe there's a couple of different single sign-ons, and then we have the stuff that's externalized that we wanna access, and it just wasn't really seamless. And so we started having conversations about going down this zero trust path. And really, we didn't make a lot of progress. Um, once COVID hit and we had a bunch of people start working from home, it actually really helped us accelerate and make some decisions that would have, you know, in all reality, taken a lot longer to, to drive um, the, with the timelines that we had uh, set goals for ourselves in the, in the beginning. So really, we looked at these four areas as things that we needed to make significant changes with the way we were doing the architecture from a security perspective at Cisco to really drive zero trust. So industry off the self identity solutions, <laughs> really making sure that we adopt best practices from an industry perspective the entire zero trust architecture and mindset that wasn't just the security team or even the IT team that was supporting the applications, but all of the users, the IT team, the security folks, everyone had to think about things a little differently, how we deploy, how we identify a user, where we're providing access, what that more fine grained access control looks like, and then really wrapping our arms around the vulnerability management aspect. So those four goals were what we started off with a big piece of it is that industry off-the-shelf identity solution. So really, we wanted to simplify things. Like, as I was painting the picture of what it looked like before, we had all these different identity stores. There were often different APIs between them. In many cases, these were things that were still written in Perl and Python um, by a you know, handful of folks that were trying to, to meet the needs of their particular application or their particular environment. And they often weren't thinking big picture. And so they were developing what in their mind was the best solution for their problem. Now, as that happens in all these silos, having that interoperability and connectivity between the different silos becomes almost impossible. Um, and when it does work, it becomes very time consuming, costly, um, you know, and, and nothing is portable. One thing changes and everything falls like a stack of cards. So taking a step back and saying, we don't always have to have 
a 100% solution for the problem in any particular silo. If we can get to 80 or 90%, and buy one solution that covers that across the board. If everyone's at 80 or 90% with a commercial off the shelf solution, that's in fact better than 15 different 100% solutions that are totally customized and not talking to each other, both from a user experience perspective and from a security perspective. And so we really had to simplify. Where things are interesting is, you know, again, rewinding back to before COVID, we knew we had to do that but there's resistance to change. People are, people are used to doing things the way that they want to. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of like, what about all the people it's not gonna work for and they're gonna call the help desk and all these things are gonna go wrong and, and you know, folks are dragging their feet. But all of a sudden we had a workforce of, you heard Fletcher talk about you know, 130,000 people in our workforce that all need to be remote in a very short amount of time. And so, you know, interestingly enough, zero trust became a solution for that. And we were very lucky to be able to increase our security posture quite a bit by the urgency that the, you know, the new work environment provided for us. And, and indeed it carries on to the hybrid work environment. Um, so it's, it, it's in no way, um, it's, it's the work that we've done up to this point is in no way wasted. We're actually finding ourselves with a lot more tools in our toolkit to handle the day-to-day -day operations of a, of a hybrid workforce. Um, identity governance, you know, really focusing on one new internal and one new external identity provider and forcing folks to move from their existing legacy providers into that new provider and really thinking about it with a cloud-first mentality. So building things or buying things with a focus on the cloud, even if it was built, being built for on-prem. And then code development and showcasing with Cisco. So we have groups like Duo at Cisco who are building a lot of these products for us. And so we get to be customer zero and really one of the first folks to roll out some of these new solutions and, and test uh, features from a Duo perspective. And we certainly have a list of improvements that we say like, we really need to have this. And, and we have a back and forth and they build it into the product and we're very happy. And then our customers end up loving it as well. So it's a really fun place to be, um, helping actually improve the products by solving the needs that we have. Um, and then our customers end up, like I, like I mentioned, um, very happy. From an industry disciplines perspective, I kind of mentioned this quickly um, and talked about some of the pain points, but something that we learned pretty early is identifying these pillars where we needed to invest. And historically, we had responsibilities split between IT and security and user experience and a lot of these different teams. And for anything to move forward, everything was done by committee. There was a vote, and if anyone wasn't satisfied, things didn't move forward. And so, because of the acceleration that COVID allowed us to, to take advantage of, we tore a lot of those barriers down and said, we're just gonna do this, we just have to. You're like, we're gonna move forward. Um, so that was a, a really um, key moment for us, at actually looking and saying, you're the decision maker for security tell us what we need to do. You're the decision maker for data security. You're the decision maker for identity and access and empowering people to do what we pay them for, to be smart and make good decisions and listen to them versus having everything together as a committee. And so there was a lot of, you know, almost like bull in the china shop behavior when this started. And, and some people were kind of maybe taken aback a little bit that, that they weren't being consulted in the ways that they had before. And they, you know, maybe didn't feel like a partner as much as they had in the past. Um, but we worked really hard uh, to try to communicate what those roadmaps looked like, what was on the, what changes were on the horizon. And, and overall, I think people were so happy with the results that, that they got over it is what it comes down to. Um, but you can see here, internal, as I mentioned, directory services, external directory services, identity and access management, privileged identity management, Data security, and, and, and this is a tricky one. Um, most of the things to the left of data security existed before Zero Trust. 
Um, data security as part of Zero Trust had some improvements, and that was really taking a little bit more time to look at all of the extra metadata we're getting from Zero Trust. And so now we're getting information about not just identity, where users are authenticating from, whether they're hitting internal and external resources, you know, a lot more rich authentication information. And so just using that to make decisions around basic access control would certainly be a good step. But what we thought would be a better step was to make some smarter decisions around uh, user behavioral uh, anomaly detection. And so feeding all that data into your typical UEBA type platforms and saying like, you know, hey, this looks like someone is coming from someplace that they don't normally come from. And, and is that normal? Um, all that kind of stuff. And making sure that you have the people to make intelligent investigations when those types of alerts pop up because they pop up all the time. I can tell you like when we started turning on some of these things, we had a user who every day came into San Jose and worked a nine to five and you know, occasionally VPN in from home or came in through zero trust and they're there on a Monday and on a Tuesday they are logging in from Syria. And so UEBA goes crazy, sends alerts to the SOC, the SOC engineers look at it and say, no, it looks like they're in Syria, this, this something, something funny's going on call the user's cell phone and you know, have a list of questions prepared, like do you have possession of your laptop? Is it open? Can you suspend it? You know, they're gonna walk through the normal, we think you've been compromised conversation. And the person's like, hello, uh, I'm sorry, it's two in the morning, I'm in Syria. <laughs> you know? It's an anomaly, but people travel. <laughs> you know, sometimes they even travel to places that, that we may think are strange. Um, you know, if you could see the number of people going into Russia at the start of the war, you'd really ask yourself why, but it happens, you know? So we may make decisions that say, we don't think that's a great idea. We're gonna make sure you don't have sensitive data on your laptop and we're gonna restrict your access. And this architecture gives us some of the flexibility to do that. But to even make those decisions, you have to have the right metadata going in to the data security team. Uh, which also ties into security intelligence. So between those two, um, you're doing the monitoring and response, securing the endpoints, et cetera. So all of that is on top of the access and identity that we get through Zero Trust. And then architecture and research. This, is, this team existed. It's, it's not like IT didn't have architects before the Zero Trust deployment, but they're really focusing on making sure that they have the right people in the right roles with Again, things like if you're thinking cloud first mentality and you've got a team that's been building everything on premise and really focused on delivering internally, sometimes you know, it, you have the people with the right skill and they just need to, to shift and think about things differently. But realistically, having a few people come in and really be change agents for a different way of thinking in the company can be really important to be successful. And so making sure that, that we're continuing to bring in change agents, you know, focusing on people that have done this sort of thing at other companies and have lots of experience has been very helpful for us moving forward. So from a zero trust perspective, practically speaking, what it looks like to us is we have user endpoints where traditionally they would type in their username and password and it would send a hash of that back to the system and it would be compared and there, there might be some certificate exchange with private certificates for things like SSL, VPNs, etc. But it went from traditional username and passwords and then we added MFA. And so still username and password and then you get an MFA push and you hit the button and then you're in on VPN. That's great. Um, provides you with some, some good security. Um, but what we really wanted was to be able to better look at those endpoints as well. We talked about the proliferation of exploits for vulnerabilities that exist. We talked about you know, sensitive data and having to make tough decisions about who can access sensitive data. And the fact that you know, there are threat actors who are trying to gain access with username and passwords that are out there 
Um, either they're gathering them through malware, or they're being dumped in credential dumps, and people are using the same passwords at other companies. Either way, username and password is not great, so throwing an MFA in there is helpful, but ideally, you want to make sure that the endpoint itself is secure as well. And so one of the things that we did was we looked at trusted endpoints by deploying a device certificate. So the endpoint gets a d device certificate that says, hey, this is an IT managed host. It has the right security posture. All of the agents that we require to have assurance that that device is in fact managed and doing the stuff that it needs exist. And it exists because you know, we're using JAM for SCCM or whatever endpoint uh, management system uh, is applicable for that platform in place and it gets a nice little certificate and everything looks good. So that's kind of traditionally been where we're at, but the, the, the evolution of that is to go a step further and actually use Duo's trusted health application instead of just a, a, a certificate that is put there by a management agent that says that everything is good. And so now in more real time, you can do things like what's your OS version? Um, it, not just is this agent installed, but is it running and healthy and correctly and it's checking in with the, the backend data store. Um, all of those capabilities and the ability to have some customization into what your requirements are exist with the Duo Trusted uh, Duo Health app. Um, on top of it, we're moving to a state where, you know, passwords aren't just nice nice to have in instances when you don't support cred uh, credential through certificate-based authentication, but they don't even exist. Like the user is gonna get to a point in the very near future where they don't even know their password. For that to happen, essentially what we do is we take a trusted user certificate and we put it on biometrics on the device, or sorry, we put it on a chip on the device that's protected with biometrics. And so you have to use you know, your fingerprint or whatever mechanism it is to actually expose the certificate. And it's a public certificate that then goes back and is, is used to actually authenticate that that user is who they say they are. And with MFA, you also get the same little context. And I will just casually mention as well, when we found that we had users that were just kind of clicking yes, in instances when they really shouldn't. We also made a config change that was available to us, which was instead of just a yes and no dialog on the device, if you go to a resource that requires authentication and you say, send me an MFA push so I can verify my identity, you get a four digit pin on the page that you're, you're requesting the authentication and you have to actually put the four digits in on your device now. So we're in a situation where even if someone wakes up in the middle of the night and just wants to hit OK, they still have to put in a pin. So there's, there is a, a, a level of protection beyond what I was describing earlier, but this is an even better state where, you know, even if there's social engineering and the bad guys are calling and saying, this is the Cisco help desk, we need you to generate a pin for us. Like, no matter what the user does, they're not gonna be able to expose their private certificate to bad guys, um, even including up to the device being compromised. So there's some pretty good controls in there. All of this with the Duo Network Gateway allows, again, us to decide where we want this level of security and where we need it, and maybe, you know, alternatives to that. Maybe we say for things like our internal directory, we don't want to force someone to actually do an MFA authentication, or, you know, maybe for certain access, we have different postures in place, and we require even more agents than we would for the, the standard IT applications. And so, you know, it really gives us flexibility to be as granular as we need to be. And from an incident response perspective, I'll tell you, like having to deal with, with someone who's been compromised and having the flexibility of them actually being remote using zero trust, they're not VPNed in, you know, they can't do things like send a bunch of random SMB requests to your Active Directory backend because they don't even have that connectivity. You know, like they're somewhat isolated except for the specific applications they need to access. And even in the early days of an incident when we're not quite sure what's going on, we can really do some things to suspend 
a lot of really sensitive access for users that we're not quite sure about, but they can still get to their email and some of the things that maybe they need to do their job. And the average user might not even know that they don't have access to sensitive applications um, that, that they maybe have to hit because of their job once a week or something like that. So it gives us a little bit more buffer in our investigations and our mitigation. So taking a step back, when this whole effort started, there was a scope and we said five months is the timeline. And the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna roll out some of the top applications that people are using to about 30,000 users in the company. And those top applications, you know, there was an effort to say, let's go back and actually look at access logs and figure out what users are going to the most. So, you know, internal directory, um, you know, a lot of benefit sites. Like th there, there's a list of things that were very, very popular destinations for all users. And so saying, let's start with the really hard ones. And the 30,000 users, let's pick users that understand the importance of security. So let's do the IT org. Let's do the security org, security sales, and then you know, some user experience folks, and really make sure that we're gonna get good feedback from those 30,000 users. And you know, security folks, one of the early pilots uh, groups, as you can imagine, um, provided lots of feedback and lots of good back and forth with IT. Um, but the surprising thing, the, again, to be super transparent, it was a lot smoother than I was expecting. You know, it, it was the sort of thing where we made the changes and suddenly, uh, you know, you just had to authenticate a lot less and had access to many things that you, you wanted access to without having to bring up a VPN tunnel. And so from a user experience perspective, people were, were actually really happy to be on the pilot, which is almost never the case. In fact, there were lots of people that were reaching out asking to be put on the pilot because they were seeing how simple it was to use and the fact that they were on the go and moving around and you know, going from coffee shops to home and all that sort of stuff. And you know, they just didn't have to, to deal with the, you know, establishing a VPN tunnel and all those sorts of things that, you know, while not that difficult, were certainly not as easy as just going to a website. The vulnerability piece is the other portion that I briefly mentioned. Um, spending some time to understand where we needed to focus, like what was actually exploitable and visible versus you know, non-observable and not exploitable and mapping that out. There are tools that are out there that help us with it, but to be honest, a lot of times it was even simpler than that, it was just, making sure that we were you know, standardizing the way we talk about vulnerabilities across all of Cisco, using common scanning tools, um, making sure that we had simple ticketing engines that we were communicating our findings. Because as you can imagine, you know, if you have a new vulnerability and you have 300,000 tickets that you need to open, that's, those aren't gonna go anywhere. <laughs> you know, it, it, being able to summarize and clearly communicate when things need to change from a vulnerability perspective and really uh, driving that velocity is something that we spent a lot of time on as part of this as well. And this is on end devices as well as servers. And so you may not uh, instantly see how they're connected, but I'll tell you like one of the, the things with zero trust that we also found is a very powerful weapon is when we started putting applications behind the, ne the Duo network gateway, we could do things like force the application team themselves to make sure the application and the host OSs are patched or limit access from a user perspective to those applications. So it is both a bit of a carrot and a stick as far as uh, you know, getting people signed up for zero trust. So we, we've, we've had a lot of success. So again, key takeaways and lesson learned, standardization, you know, commercial off the shelf solutions, while they might not be 100%, uh, like a homegrown solution, realistically, they're gonna scale much more and you're gonna have a lot less technical debt as time goes on. Making sure that you're organizing, organizing around all of the, the security disciplines that are out there, um, extremely important. Um, 
that zero trust mindset and thinking about all of the different tools that are now in your toolbox from a zero trust perspective and leveraging those not just for security but for user experience and then the vulnerability management piece. All of those have been really critical to our journey so far and it's exciting to get a chance to chat with you all about it. So for today, we are out of time. I would love if there are any questions to have a chance to answer them. We have, we have a couple of questions for you, Mike. And don't cool. forget, everyone, if you do have questions, please post them on the WebEx Teams room. So to start, having gone through the zero trust transformation at Cisco, with hindsight being 2020, what would you change based on your lessons learned? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, to be honest, there were a lot of reservations about even beginning the journey because I think in our minds we had understood the severity of the problems and the amount of effort that was going to go into it, and there was a lot of fear associated with that change. Being on the other side of it, everyone is, is all around much happier, you know, both from a security perspective and a user experience perspective. So, you know, I think a little bit of a kick to get going, um, which COVID helped us out with, but it would have been nice to have accelerated it before that happened. So, cool. Thank you, Mike. So the next question is, what's the best way to deploy zero trust for machine-to-machine -machine communications? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So zero trust for machine-to-machine, -machine, like there are a lot of tools that are out there for identity management and automation. And so you could certainly leverage some of those tools that are doing things like generating temporary one-time tokens for machine-to-machine -machine communication. Um, from a zero trust perspective, uh, it's, it's really all about the applications. And so, you know, having the applications identified that you want to have those protections for, figuring out what that account-to-account -account communication looks like, and then provisioning things that can actually do some of those token, temporary token generations for you, I think is a, is a good way to go about it. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily reap all of the fun rewards of user experience when you're talking application to application. Um, however, you still get a lot of the fine-grained access control that you can put in place. Now, I'll be super transparent and say, for us, that was not our original goal. Our goal was very user-focused, and so there are still plenty of application-to-application -application communications that's happening on the back end without Zero Trust being involved. However, there are areas where the Duo Network Gateway is the only way that you're going to talk to an application, and so you're forced to do it the right way in those instances. Cool, thanks, Mike. Next up. What is the biggest challenge when you switch to zero trust? I think the biggest challenge for us has been onboarding of the applications. And so actually having the infrastructure set up to support this migration, I don't want to say it was fairly simple. You know, there was a lot of work that, that was done. Um, but actually looking at the applications and changing the way that the applications authenticate and making sure for us we had specific requirements that said, we're now going to expose this application that exists in what was traditionally internal. You know, it lives in a data center, not even in a DMZ. And we're going to say, you can now be accessed by an identity outside of Cisco. So to be honest, that was a little bit scary when we did that. And so part of what we did was we said that metadata that we wanted to gather to make good decisions from a threat intelligence and data security perspective, like we wanted some more stuff in there. And so we wanted to make sure that all of our applications were set up in a way that they were logging all of the critical metadata and the fields that we really needed and onboarding them into our UEBAs and, and our SOC, those types of things. To, from my perspective, uh, that onboarding of applications was definitely one of the, the things that was most time consuming and most difficult from a zero trust perspective. Yeah. And the last question is, what would be that sweet swap, spot that strikes a balance between user experience and security for on-prem employees? Is populating a PC laptop with tons of security agents a healthy practice? <laughs> no, I think no one wants more security agents. That, that, that seems to be a, 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 you know, pretty common um, from you know, most of the folks that we're talking to. And I think what you're actually seeing is convergence of agents where, you know, in the past, you, know, you might have one agent for telemetry and another agent for AV and another agent for you know, endpoint detection and, and, oh, like, let's throw umbrella on there for DNS and all these different things. I think now 
especially from a Cisco perspective, you're going to start to see agents like Cisco Secure now has um, OS query through Orbital built into it, right? And those would have traditionally been different agents. Um, AnyConnect, having Umbrella and network visibility module for NetFlow built into the agent. Like all of those kind of uh, uh, consolidations are happening. So I, I do think that there is, you know, depending on every organization is going to have their own requirements, but everyone should have the minimum bar for deciding what they need for an endpoint to be secure. And that's going to depend on, you know, the mission of the company. And so at Cisco, we've come up with a, a fairly small list of agents. And again, many of them are performing functions that several other agents used to perform. And that, to us, is what we need for good security. So it's a good question, but I think it's a very personal question for the security team at your specific company. Cool. Well, that's all the questions we've got time for. Cool. So thank you very much, Mike. My phone is at the center of my world. Life and work all in one, wherever I am. And now, with WebEx Go, I can easily balance both. Enterprise grade calling with my phone and an experience I'm used to. Personal calls are still on my plan and phone number. And for work, I make and receive calls on a dedicated business line with great call quality. I connect with clients, coworkers, you name it, on a separate secure mobile network without sharing my personal information. WebEx Go is built into iOS and Android, giving you the best possible calling experience. And that experience seamlessly extends across my WebEx workflow. Now I'm taking my business calling and my collaboration tools anywhere my work takes me. That's WebEx Go. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house. Zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. A classroom is no longer a room. It's wherever a student is. It's wherever curiosity plants a seed in a mind sprites wildly and then demands to be fed more 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 it's wherever someone asks why or how or what's at the bottom of a black hole a classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn through secure remote and hybrid learning cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom and we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world. Powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge. If you think about most of the products today, we've gone away from a world where everything was just sell, implement, and you're done, to a place where adoption is the key. Especially if you think about renewals and how you're going to renew uh, what you've essentially sold to your customers, you need to ensure that adoption happens. The key to adoption is implementation, but implementation is not easy in today's world, especially when every single company is dealing with multiple different vendors. So our partners play a 
big part because they're not only able to get the implementation done, but they're also able to integrate across all the different vendors. And that's something that is unique with our partner ecosystem. So leveraging them as well as being uh, there with them along the journey, I think is the reason for the ultimate success of customer experience. So next up we have Kelly Jones. She's over from the US and is our Chief People Officer at Cisco. She's a teacher at her core and is driven by a firm belief in unleashing the, attention in, in unleashing the potential in other people is the foundation of leadership. She's joined by Elle Kavanagh Lomas. She's our VP for People and Communities. She's passionate about driving business outcomes that have the employee experience at heart. Without further ado, please welcome Kelly. everybody. I feel like I have to acknowledge that this is a technical conference, but this session is going to be about people. So it might feel like a little bit of a one-off. We're going to go into the human side of all the work that we do. And the reason is, if you think about every product from a Cisco standpoint that we design, sell, and support, it's all done by a human being. And so for us, it's incredibly important to understand and make sure our people strategy supports our business strategy. So we're going to talk a little bit about hybrid world, the topic that seems to be coming up all over. We're going to do a little bit of an overview with some data and insights. We're going to talk about the implications of this to a people strategy. And then I'm going to invite Elle onto the stage. We're going to do some Q&A. You can ask your questions. And we're going to have an opportunity to double click a little bit into the EMEA perspective. So I'd like to start with a question that I actually think is the wrong question. I spend a lot of time in conversations with other chief people officers and CEOs about hybrid. And the first question is, how often should I bring people back? Do we do it two days? Is it three days? Should they come in every day? The reality is right now, there's a full spectrum of things that people are trying. You have complete return to office, we paid for the building, we want everybody in it, to everybody's doing fine remote, let them, let them be remote. What we chose to do at Cisco was a little bit different. We have a hybrid policy that says, we're not gonna mandate days in office, we're gonna allow each leader and team to decide what works for them based on their work and based on the business that they're in. So we don't have a mandate. And I'll share with you, this has been infinitely harder than a mandate. If we would have said just come in on Tuesday and Wednesday, it would have been a lot easier. People would have known exactly what to do. But it's also infinitely better. And we're going to get a little bit into what some of the data and insights tell us about people. But I think asking where people should work is fundamentally the wrong question. What we like to focus on is how do you unleash the highest potential? in your leaders, in your teams, and in your individual contributors, while still looking at culture and understanding well-being in the system. So we start there. A little bit about hybrid work at Cisco I'll share with you. We had a slight advantage prior to the pandemic because we've always had choice and flexibility at the center of how we work. So we used to be able to leverage this, actually, and talent attraction is a bit of a differentiator. If you come here, you can work hybrid. You know, you can have flexibility in what you do. Now everyone is offering that. So we're seeing something uh, quite different, and it's having implications on the talent market, which we're going to talk about. But prior to the pandemic, 37% of our employees worked from home three plus days a week, which is higher than average, I would say, prior to the pandemic. But right now, that number is up to 89%. So it's a significant increase, although when you double click into this, double click into this, you see there are some nuances in the hybrid experience. Not everybody is, is working the same, which actually indicates to me the strategy is working, it's how we designed it. We felt like we, we would see differences amongst groups. And what we see is in the Americas, it's more common to not be in office. 57% of people aren't coming into the office. 32% of our employees are coming in one to two days. That's mostly common in EMEA and APJC. And 11% are coming in three days plus. When you look into the functional and the regional side of this, engineering is in more, which actually we would expect, because if engineering product, they tend to want to sit together. There, there are moments that they really do need to be together and do uh, what my friend Jonathan Davis calls the swivel meeting. They like to swivel and have the conversation. Engineering's in more, APJC is in more. 
I want to share a little bit about this because there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, do we have everybody come back? Is the softening, the f uh, perceived softening in the employment market going to create a situation where we can now go, okay, everybody now has to come back? That was the first question I got when people started to feel like tech jobs were softening a little. Can we now make, can, now can we make them come back? Because we couldn't earlier, can we do it now? The reality is it's actually not changing sentiment. The sentiment around this with our employee base and with all of your employee bases continues to be focused on choice and flexibility. And, and we're looking at the global hybrid work survey data from Cisco here on the left. We did a survey of companies around the world last year, and 71% of employees expressed that they want a hybrid working arrangement across their industry. And what I'll say about this, this other question comes up a lot about people returning to office. What we learned in this survey was, it's not that people don't want to come into the office. They just want to come into the office for meaning and for purpose. They don't want to come into the office and work asynchronously. So it's changed how we're thinking about spaces, and I think how everyone is thinking about spaces, and it's changed how we're thinking about technology, which we'll go into a little bit. We know that 52% of employees are saying that flexible policies are going to affect their decision to stay with their employer. We had a prediction around this that as things start, started to get more common in a hybrid world that you might see people getting used to being asked to come into the office. They're not. That, that's still a very strong preference to have choice and flexibility. And then the last thing I'll tell you, the 64% of employees would consider looking for a new job if return to office was mandated. We're continuing to see this. We're continuing to see in the external market when we say everybody must come back X, Y, Z days um, that it does have an impact on attrition. But I also want to share with you, hybrid work policies are dynamic. They're not static. And, and as we learn what teams work together in different ways better, we're going to adjust this. And I recommend that hybrid is a policy, hybrid policies are something that we look at kind of continuously. We have experiments running now throughout Cisco. We have some teams that are saying we want everybody in two days a week and we're going to measure the impact on our productivity. We have other teams that are saying we're going to have everybody in one day a week and make it a collaboration day and we're going to measure the impact that that has on our innovation scores. We're going to measure the impact that that has on team well-being and their sense of safety within their teams. So if we were having this conversation in a year, I'm probably going to have some interesting insights on what we learn from all of those teams. But it's very much still an experiment, but grounded in the fact that we know external talent really wants to have choice and flexibility. So hybrid is about not choosing where we work, but how we're going to work. And at Cisco, our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And there's a strong element in that about for all means work has to work for everyone. So it allows us to respect work styles across the board. So Let's talk a little bit about the changing talent market. Hybrid is one element of this. Certainly hybrid work has changed the talent market, but there's been a larger disruption that's happened with employees and with, with uh, candidates, because we consider candidates when we think of all this as well, that is really reevaluating their lives a bit. What we're seeing are people are less concerned with fitting their lives into their work, and they're more thinking about fitting their work into their lives. So this has fundamentally changed to all of our candidates and how they're thinking about work. So attracting talent. I know I talked a lot about the flexibility piece, and I'm, so I won't, uh, I won't go deeply into that, but I will say that there are very strong empirical data points around this piece. They did a career builder study last year. Jobs that list hybrid work get seven times more applicants. So if you're really looking to widen your applicant field there, seven times more is a pretty compelling number. There's also been some very deep empirical data done around psychology, neuroscience, and biology. And what they demonstrate is that we've seen foundational changes in human behavior that have been caused by the pandemic. And so when we think about work, it needs to catch up with that. Non-traditional employees, and I don't know if anyone in here is scheduled to go to my friend Alistair's session that's happening later in the week. Um, Alistair at Cisco is doing a session on our skill-based talent journey, and it's actually a great example of how we're starting to think about skills at Cisco. So we're doing this, and I'm seeing this a lot with our competitor companies and our peer companies, moving away from pedigree, the idea that every single job we have has to have a degree, are there areas that we can just look at the skill and see if you can demonstrate you have the skills to do the job, 
then you're welcome. We, we want to have you come into the house. So non-traditional employees is a strong way that, that we're looking at it. And the other thing I would offer here, if you look at the math, you look at the amount of people that are actually leaving the workforce now and over the next 10 to 15 years, and the skills they're taking with them, and you juxtapose that with the skills coming into the workforce. So millennials are gonna be three quarter of our workforce by 2024. There are less of them. They do not have the foundational tech skills to do most of these jobs. And so starting to widen the aperture a bit and look at non-traditional employees, upskilling, reskilling, and being a bit more flexible about how we bring talent in. And then the last thing I would say is purpose. You know, there's been increasing studies around the fact that employees typically come to work and want to work for purpose. We all get a paycheck for sure. But McKinsey did a study last year and they found that 70% of people actually define their purpose through their work. 70% of people define their purpose through their work. That's compelling. So being able to create a sense of purpose for our employees in our organization helps us to attract and retain great talent. The next thing I want to talk about is leadership, and I'm super passionate about this one because I actually feel like nothing has changed more than leadership since the pandemic. And if we would have come into this room five years ago and I would have asked you, what do you think the critical elements are for a great leader? We probably would have heard things like ability to align a strategy to a company vision, have an execution plan that supports that, measure that, measure performance, and all of that is still important. That's the running of the business. So we still need leaders to run business, to, to run their business. But I would actually add the thing that has changed in here is some of the things that we've traditionally thought about as soft skills, compassion, empathy, connection, communication. When I went to college, I went to NC State, and all of my friends were in engineering. I was the complete one-off, kind of like this room right now. I was the one-off in college. And I remember having conversations where they would say, I don't know why I have to take communications classes. I'm, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm not going to do these things. The reality is communication is one of the things that obviously it's, it's clearly important to all of us. But when we think about our employees and the time we spend aligning to the work that they're doing and to the vision, it, it becomes critically important. So leading with compassion, the soft skills are not hard skills in leadership, I would say, and really being the connection over to our teams. And I'm gonna share the attrition data with you here in a moment, but one of the things that we learned is that ability to articulate the mission of the company and how their role aligns to that is one of the things that creates great stickiness with our employees. So let's talk about retaining talent. And I want to say the first thing, when we think about retention, one thing that always comes up is, if I had more money, I'd, I'd be able to keep them more. If I could pay them more, I'd be able to keep them more. And yes, we absolutely have to pay our employees fairly, all of us in this room. We have to provide a competitive compensation package as part of the entire employee value proposition. But the money we pay our employees, it does not actually buy their loyalty. It just rents it. The things that create loyalty, we did a, a, a study over about five years, an attrition study at Cisco, to figure out what creates stickiness with our employees, what keeps us from having great retention. And there were four data points that were strongly statistically correlated with why people stay. People stay when they're enthusiastic about the mission of your company. People stay when they get to use their strengths every day, when they have confidence in the company's future, and when they're challenged to grow. Regardless of what function you're in, what job you're in, how, how old you are, how long you've been at Cisco, these four data points are strongly correlated with people who stay. So what I would leave you with in this is, yes, money is important, absolutely pay your people competitively, but we have a little bit of a blueprint about how to show up as a leader. We have a bit of a map about how we can help our employees uh, be, them full, be their full selves at work and stay with us. So at this point, I'm going to move on because I'd like to get to your questions. But first, I'm going to invite El Cavanaugh-Lomas to the stage, who is our people partner lead in EMEA, to share some EMEA perspective with you as well. And then we're going to get to your questions. Welcome, El. Hey, it's great to be here. So I get the privilege of a couple of things. First of all, I get to ask Kelly some questions. Some of those questions we've 
captured from previous audiences like this at Cisco Live and other places where we've had lots of questions about this topic from leaders everywhere. So we thought we'd try and reflect a couple of those. Um, and then I thought I'd start a little bit with um, sort of my perspective and seeing it in and how we apply it in EMEA just to a certain extent. So <clears throat> if we think about it, at the end of the day, we're all people. And sometimes we forget that. And we forget that we need to look at what's going on for our employees and what's going on in their lives and that we're not telepathic and that we can't just guess what's going on for them. So you might look at somebody and you might think to yourself, well, you know, yeah, I know their home life could be a little bit bumpy. I know they've got some stuff going on, but I think they're fine. And what we've living to learn is that that's not true. People aren't always saying. They're trying to put a brave face on things. They're trying to manage because in this post-pandemic environment, we're all trying to get back to some kind of normal and racing to reclaim the life that we've just lost in this period. And I think if you look at people, you might make ju uh, judgments and guess what's going on for me, for example, in my life. But if I said to you, actually, through the pandemic, I, was, um, I got divorced. Um, I inherited not just shortly my mum, who has Alzheimer's, and she lives with me in my home. And then I also got a puppy. So I do think I'll be a statistic of, the, of this time. You don't know that about me unless you ask, okay? So we're saying to ourselves, how can we look at empathy from the perspective of standing in somebody's shoes and you don't know what's going on for them. You can't guess, you've just got to try and find out and dig a little bit and probe. And then as a company, we look at it through four lenses. So we take it through the idea of people, policies, workspaces and technology. And if we think of each of them a little bit, we'd say if you look at people, do you know that if you don't feel included in where you work from a neuroscience perspective in your brain, that shows up as physical pain, just the same as if somebody hit you. So if you feel left out in your working environment, sometimes people do, how do you make that more inclusive? So for example, we used to walk the halls and we'd say we'd have the water cooler conversations and we'd meet people but we don't always have those things now so how do you create that environment anyway for people how do you make sure that you have that connection uh, and do that then if we do that with um we look, people want to feel empowered. They don't want to feel micromanaged. So therefore, if people's reaction to them working at home is something like, you know, we don't trust you, anything that's lacking in trust is sort of set to fail. And so we're trying to say, what can we put in place from a policy perspective that will give people what they need? So maybe they need a different chair now at home if they're working from home. Maybe they need, I don't know, maybe they're worried about fuel costs going to an office with the rising price of fuel. Maybe they're worried about their electricity, their gas bills at home. Lots of different things to think about that we wouldn't have necessarily thought about before. But knowing that we want to regulate that enough so that people feel confident and comfortable doing it, but not so comfortable that they are, that it's so strict that they don't feel like they can be themselves. Then from a workspace perspective. We need it to be a magnet to people who want to come in. Do you want to go into an office space that's the same kind of space that you were in 25 years ago, excuse me, however old you are, but you want something that attracts you in, that makes you want to be there, that makes you collaborate? How many people want to go into the office on a day-to-day -day basis just to do their to-do list? If I asked you to raise your hands, how many would you just like to go in and just do your tasks? Nobody wants to do that anymore, but we used to do that all the time. So how can we make it now that a place to, you, the place you go to work is somewhere you go to collaborate and work together with people and have a great experience, and the rest of the stuff gets done in a different way, much more efficiently. And then last is technology, and I'm going to bridge to, to Kelly in this moment, because technology, obviously, the crux of everything we're here about, and we're talking a lot about technology and how it can help us on this journey with, um, with hybrid. What's your view, Kelly, in your seat, how you're seeing this? I think that technology is one of the pillars that is critical to us being able, to anyone being able to do this right. And, and there's a lot of elements to it. There's an inclusion element to it, because if you think about remote work prior to the pandemic, even the word remote is like the other, you know, the other was there. Um, hybrid is not remote work. Hybrid is kind of full inclusion of everyone that is in the meeting. So there's a technology aspect around how you use your collaboration tools with things like 
People Insights, which is a great uh, way of ensuring that you're driving inclusion. But there's also an ability to use some of the technology to understand some of the some of the rituals and behaviors that might not be as visible. So within People Insights, for example, I have an opportunity to, when I log in, it can say, gosh, you haven't connected with Elle in a long time, but you've connected with all these other people. What's going on with Elle? <laughs> How's Elle doing? So it, it will kind of nudge you around like your meeting schedule and who it is you're connecting with. I also get some insights that might say, you know what, you scheduled 80% uh, of your meetings outside of someone else's core working hours. And in a fully hybrid world, everybody works different hours. I have people on my team who have kids in soccer and they leave at three and they go to the soccer field, they watch the game, they get the kids, they do the snacks. I'm sorry, they have kids in football. Wrong word, wrong continent. <laughs> kids in football. So uh, they, they go and watch the kids play football and uh, br bring them back and, and then catch up when they need to. And so they have that time blocked. And so what I know is I'm not going to reach out to them between three and five because they're, they're watching the match. And so what People Insights allows me to do is say, did you reach out to Elle in the hours that she blocked off? Because maybe you had something to do with your mom. Maybe you do this thing every day at the same time. And so it will tell you, you know, how often are you doing this? And create some awareness as a leader about what might be a blind spot of my own. Uh, but I'll also say, flipping over a little bit to some of the how we lead teams, you know, we have a product that we use called TeamSpace at, at Cisco, and it allows us to check in with our teams, find out what their highest priority work is. We ask them, what do you love and what do you loathe? And loathe is a very strong word, but we ask it intentionally. Because when people are, are starting to report things they loathe a lot, you know maybe they're not working in their strengths and working, working in flow. But we also ask them two questions. I'm able to use my strengths every day last week and I contribute a great value. And, and the same way that I kind of shared the key questions around attrition, those are the two questions that drive engagement. So as a leader, I use the technology actually to be able to say, hmm, Elle has not been checking in high on these metrics for the last couple of weeks. Maybe I need to inspect that. Maybe we need to have a conversation. And to be clear, the digital technology in that case doesn't replace the conversation. It just gives you a little bit of a guide on how to have it. And a bit of a prompt, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I wonder about is, and that lots of people wonder about, is some leaders in some organisations are being super grumpy about the idea of people not coming back to work. We're not. We don't claim to be the absolute experts in this. We're just having a punt on what we think is the right thing to do. Why do you think that is? Why, you know, what's going on there? You know, first of all, I'd say no one is the expert at this. And, and to be clear, um, I, I try to be very confident in what we know to be true from our data and very humble in the face of what we don't know. So we're all kind of learning as, as we go, I would say. Um, I think where some of that comes from, I feel like it's two things. I think some of it is, as leaders, we have a tendency to project ourselves onto our teams. So the way that we learned, the way that we were mentored, the way that we were led feels like the way to lead. And, and I think it's a natural inclination. Um, I cook a little bit like my mom does. My mom's a terrible cook, but I grew up watching her do it. So I think some of it is, is a little bit of that. But I also think there's a little bit of fear and uncertainty around the productivity question. And there's fear and uncertainty around the early in career question, that's one I get a lot, where that's the first two things that follow after I get the question about when can I bring people back? How do I know, how do I know productivity is high? I feel like we're not innovating as much as we should be, or I feel like we're not as productive as we should be. Um, and I understand that actually, because in some, some roles, there are not very linear productivity metrics. So I think some of it is that, it's what people are comfortable with. So it's a, it's a comfort factor. And we've talked about, um, in Amiss, we've done some of the work on, on our offices, not, not all of them. Um, but what we're looking at, so where we once might have put an, an office out by an airport, for example, so people could get into it really easily. Now we want it to be in a location where there is an ability to get there quickly for people from where they live, where it's nice, where it's attractive. But people care about a lot more than that. They care about whether the, biz the building is energy efficient and sustainable. And we're seeing a real different um, mindset on this. How do you differentiate between sort of the earlier in career, as we might say, the next generation and leaders from before? You talked about it in the statistics a little bit, but. Yeah, I mean, the most interesting thing when you think about office space for early in career, in my mind, you know what really matters? Coffee. 
having good coffee. I know that sounds crazy, but you know, if you're going to come into the office, you want the coffee better than the coffee at home. It's, it's actually a factor. But I just spent some time with our early and career team last week in India. And what was fascinating, when I started asking them about hybrid, how often do you work at home? When are you in? What I realized was they had self-organized about 40 of them across all the functions. So you had the people and communities team, the engineering team, the 1X team, IT, the, tech, the TAC. They didn't work together. They didn't have a need to be there together. And they didn't really miss the building. What they missed was each other. You know, they missed being in fellowship with each other. And so what I see with, with early in career, they want the flexibility without a doubt. You know, they don't want to be told to come in every day for no reason. A lot of them started doing this, started with this type of work. But I think there is a strong desire to be around each other and learn from each other. But to your point, you need then different spaces. You know, and so office spaces become more collaboration zones, learning zones, focus zones. Like, I think it's requiring all of us to rethink our offices. And if our leaders are sat here wondering what it takes to be a next generation leader in this environment, what would be your advice? Well, I think that it, it's definitely about taking the time to understand your employees and get to know them. You know, getting to know them, particularly for early in career, getting to know them beyond just their skills and what they bring to the job. And this isn't always a comfortable thing for people who've been leading a long time, because some of us have been taught leave your work at work, leave your home at home. And I think the pandemic kind of like put the boundary, knocked down the boundary walls. And so now what I would say is employees want to know that you know them and to lead them, they have to feel like you care about them and care about their success. I also think that one of the biggest things that we're starting to see for people coming in development really matters. You know, they really want to know that they're in a role that they can grow. So the time that I that we can spend as leaders talking to them about their development, I think is is really critical. Nice. And how do you, well, I said earlier that you, we're not walking the floors anymore necessarily. We're not perhaps getting exposure to leaders in the way that we once were or seeing them. We might be at home more than we're not. How do you ensure more equity and fairness in, a, in the working environment? Yeah, that's a great question, and particularly because we know that underrepresented talent tends to choose to work remote more than not for a variety of reasons. Women tend to choose it more. And so you, the, the hybrid model, if you're not really careful about how you kind of map and ensure fairness in your processes, you can get a little proximity bias that starts to come in. You know, we, we value the contributions of those we see a little bit more because we see them and we feel like because we see them, they're working. So for me, it's a little bit about understanding the data in terms of who's coming in who, from, a, from a hiring standpoint, what's the experience they're having throughout their hiring process? Who's dropping out where? You know, once they're on board, there's an, uh, there's an opportunity to look at things like promotional velocity. How does that then look? But I also think that technology plays a role in that. Um, you know, people focus plays a role in that as part of the WebEx tool because the, the, the technology is a strong part. But the other part I would add is the rituals around the technology are equally as important. So one of the things we did, you may remember this, we did the hybrid, uh, the hybrid contracting with every team. When we decided we were going to be fully hybrid, we have every leader sit down and basically facilitate with their team. How are we going to work together? If Elle's at home and I'm in the office, how do we ensure that on video, she's not just the talking head on mute that everyone forgets is there? Because that's the classic thing that used to happen if you were at home. You know, people just forgot that you were there. So some of it is also your rituals. And one of the things we did on our team, I have a couple introverts on my team, and they're not the first ones to talk but they're usually thinking when the rest of us are talking. So you really do want to hear from them. And so one of the things we decided as a team is we're going to pause at moments and go, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and make sure that we're interjecting that into our, into our team meetings. So I think it's technology, it's rituals, and it's understanding what your data tells you about the experience your employees are having. Uh, one of the other things that we've created is we did a, this thing called Veniware in Italy, sponsored by our Italian um, leaders. And it's a place where people can come together to have an immersive experience for a couple of months. So they might be together for, say, three months in one place. They come to Venice, they experience Venice, but they also use our buildings, which have been set up, and they collaborate in that way. What do you think it's going to take to come up with more things like this so that people have different ways of coming together? What do you see? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think that certainly designing spaces that attract people, and Chuck, Chuck has said magnet, uh, not a mandate around office spaces. I think designing, we're, we're almost asking leaders to become 
event planners in doing this. You know, like it's not enough to say come in on Tuesday. You now kind of have to create a reason for them to be there. Um, so I think a little bit of it is intentionality around why are we together? What does the space look like? If we're coming in to do something like launch a project together, if we're in the storming phase of a project, then how do you create a physical space that's going to be conducive to that? I also think that what we've seen is when the pandemic started, everybody tried to make their home an office, and now we're trying to make the offices home homey. So we have more sofas, more natural light, plants, all of the things. Um, but I also think that we're going to keep learning as we go with this. You know, we're, we don't know what we don't know around some of this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, <clears throat> we started talking about the difference between remote work and hybrid work. Would it be fair to say that remote working in that sense is sort of over? I, well, I personally never use the word remote work anymore because, I mean, in a, in a fully hybrid world, and I'm actually kind of done with hybrid work too, I feel like it's just work at this point, like we should just call it work, but it's, it's still hybrid work at this point. Um, remote work in general, we're not using it in our, in our taxonomy just because we're fully hybrid. And sometimes that means you're on site, sometimes that means you're off site, sometimes that means you're home, you're at someone else's house, you're at a coffee shop, you're at a WeWork, you're wherever you may be. Um, so remote, I'm, I'm hearing that less and less too from others. I heard one of our leaders say the other day that they wanted to be really accountable for where they were each day of the week. So sometimes they found that since this period's gone past, they've sort of woken up on Wednesday and realized they haven't been to their office. They've just sat at their desk at home all week. Where are they deliberately each day? Do you manage that in your working time? Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I know what, I, I love that they're doing that as well. I hadn't heard that because leaders actually are also a bit of a magnet to have people come in. So if you want people to come in and, and early in career, if you want your early in career to come in to be mentored, you have to have people in the room that can mentor them. And so leaders are a draw. Um, intentionality around that is important. Um, I actually live, I live in an area where we close the office. I live in uh, Colorado in a city called Denver and we close the office in Denver. And so I'm very intentional when I travel. I spend a lot of time in San Jose. I'm very intentional about making sure the teams know that I'm going to be there. You know, I've open office hours these days. You know, if you'd like to come in, this is the time that I'm going to be there. But I think that intentionality is really smart. I think you're going to see followership the days that they're in. I think so too, because I know that I don't want to go and sit in a room and look at a screen all day or look at a wall all day. I may as well do that, save the commute. But I also think we've also heard a lot of narrative about people enjoying, they miss their podcast yeah. on the way to work. They miss that downtime. They miss making the transition. How do you think, what do you do? What do people do to make transition when they are working remotely? Yeah. It's the ritual of, of the going to work and the coming home from work. And rituals you know, have been around forever. They're very deep seated in our consciousness. And I think that you have to create a ritual. And what I always say to my employees and, and what we see is, I think I saw something that said, employees are giving eight and a half hours of unpaid overtime every week when they work hybrid. And some of it is because they don't know how to create boundaries. Some of, it, some of it is, I think, they're happy to be at home and they don't want anyone to think that they're not working. So they're kind of overworking and they've got their computer on where they're trying to cook dinner and, and they never really shut off. I think it's just replacing that with another ritual. And so whether if you have a home office, that can be shutting your door as you go in and, and have dinner. If you don't have a home office, that can be something like, as silly as it sounds, closing your laptop, washing your hands, you know, doing something that is like, I'm, I'm transitioning from this part to this. I talked about the brain wanting to change state, right? This idea of doing something repetitive that breaks the cycle um, and that maybe we want to ch like, change our behaviors in that way. Yeah. What I'd love to do now is to come to the team for the questions that have come in from the room so that we can explore a little bit what you'd like to know. Hi, yes, we've got some That's questions. Yours. Lovely. So if we can start with, work from home creates different challenges compared to traditional office working. Collaboration technology helps, but it's not a complete substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. What have been your greatest challenges in this new era and how do you handle them? Up to you. Um, 
I agree with that comment, by the way. Uh, I'm someone who gets a lot of energy from being around people, which is why it's so fun to, to be back at Cisco Live and, and be doing these things. I think what you have to do is know the strategy that works for your team. And so I'll give you an example. One of the things we realized on my team, I have a fully hybrid disaggregated team. They sit everywhere all over the world. And for the most part, we can work that way. But what we need to do is about once a quarter get together and take the projects that we're launching. When we're launching something new into the system, we need we need the forming time. We, we don't do that as well remotely. We need to get in a room and be with each other and spend that time and get that trust and safety because when you have that trust and safety, you can move a lot faster in getting the work done. So I think it's a little bit of a balance. Um, I think just being intentional about what works for you and for the team uh, is really is really how you would do it. I mean, I've seen a little bit of everything. I see people that do uh, that where they don't have a site, they get together and they volunteer, because again, I don't think people miss the office as much as they miss each other and they miss the community. Yeah. Would, would you add anything to that? Um, no, I, I agree with you. I think let's let's keep going. I, I, I'm with you. Yeah. The next one is, what are future predictions about remote only work? You from the data. I think, yeah, I mean, from what our data is telling us, I think we're going to see some jobs and some companies that go off-site all the time for certain things. It's, it's already happening. People have realized the roles that you maybe don't need to bring people back for. I think where people are struggling are those ones in the middle that they're, they're not on-site all the time, but they're not off-site all the time. How do we then get that blend? Um, I think you're going to start to see, based on role, the work that is asynchronous and isn't as collaborative, I think you're going to start to see companies that allow people to just be off-site all of the time. And there's a scary thing around that with the technology, because you're starting to see all the and forgive me if someone in the room does this, but all the trackers that are like, we're going to take your picture every few minutes and make sure you're in front of your computer and measure how long you're on your keyboard. If you didn't know this, look it up. It's really frightening. It's created a cottage industry of... Uh, little tools that will shake your mouse every few seconds so that your mouse looks like it's moving. So I think that we're going to be in an interesting new era in, in the fully uh, remote and offsite. But I do think you're going to see some jobs and some companies that stay with it completely. One of the things that I think is really interesting is mental health for people. We're hearing a lot of people who are working from home, from their office environment, in, in whatever way, maybe late at night, through the night, whatever suits them, what, re what really works for them. But then when it does come to coming to an office or an yeah. environment like this, it feels utterly overwhelming. And it's about, I think, how you find the line between the two. How can you have technology help bridge that so people don't feel so disconnected that something like this is overwhelming? And that's a risk for us a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Thank you both. Next up we have, how do you balance between our privacy rights as individuals and the metrics you're both using? It's a great question. You want to? Uh, I think we um, say that, sorry, say it again. Say it again. Uh, sorry, second. Privacy rights of individuals versus the metrics we're tracking. Wonderfully said. <laughs> I think that we, I mean, to your previous answer, really, I think we're trying to be really sensitive to it and really overt. So secret measurement is not the way to go, I don't think. I think trying to, you know, track people's secret screen time. If we're doing anything or looking at any data like that, it's with a view to saying to people, you're working too many hours, you've been in right. front of the screen too long, you haven't moved enough, you haven't done anything, you know, you've been online seven days a week. Those kind of things, not as spyware in some way. Totally, and, and, and there's also some of the data I shared earlier around engagement and what we know to be true in those spaces, it's metadata. It's not this is, this is what Lucy thinks or Bob thinks, it's metadata. So we're not going down to the individual level on some of that. Um, and the productivity, if this question was about the productivity metrics, and privacy, um, I'll just offer, it's challenging in some areas. We have some groups that's quite easy. Sales organizations, you can measure productivity. TAC, you can measure productivity. But then you get into some groups where it's much more challenging. So there's not a really strong productivity measure. It could be, you know, software release dates, bugs, you know, you can look at some things like that, but uh, we're not measuring it everywhere because it's, it's not possible. But I think metadata I would also offer too. Definitely. Oh, thank you. So next up we have, how is Cisco cultivating leader mindsets to help navigate leaders, navigate hybrid and enable them to succeed in the way of working? 
Well, I think I'd comment to say that we we set our leadership expectations. We say out loud what we expect of leaders in a very simple framework so that they can come to the party knowing what to bring and what's expected. But we also message a lot about accountability around this space. We do a leader check-in where the company, we started a lot doing it a lot during the pandemic where our CEO would bring us together for a check-in as leaders to talk about what we can do to help. That process has continued to continue to bring, bring people together as much as they can and to make sure that people are holding their leaders accountable as well, that it's not okay to just be forgotten. We've had, you know, you get the feedback people sometimes, maybe in a sales force, haven't spoken to their leader except to ask them what their number is for a really long time. How do you change that? Yeah. I mean, the rituals at Cisco, I think, are very important. We have a set of rituals that we ask leaders to participate in. And, and I, I want to be clear with this because you don't lead like I lead. We, you know, different leaders are different. So I don't believe that there's one version of a leader. There's multiple versions of leaders. But there are behaviors that we know drive the right outcomes when it comes to listening, when it comes to asking the lived experience of your team. You know, our, we do an engagement pulse, which is a little different than the... Um, the company listening, we have company listening that we run each quarter, that's our real deal survey, but engagement pulse is mine as a leader, where I basically, every quarter, will ask my team a series of questions, and again, it's metadata, you don't know who says what in that, but you start to understand um, how they're experiencing you, and then we do a readout on that, and we talk about it as a team, and one of the things we found was, for people who were leaving Cisco, if you were never asked to participate in engagement pulse, you are 2,000 times more likely to leave. 2,000 times. So it is a powerful, it, it's a powerful way to just re-recruit your employees just by asking them about their experience and being willing to have the conversation. You're re-recruiting them and you're, and you're having it before they might be walking out the door and having that what could we have, what could we have done conversation. Love it. Yep. So work from home creates different challenges compared to the traditional office working. Collaboration technology helps, but it's not a complete substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. What have been your greatest challenges in this new era and how do you handle them? Budget. <laughs> I mean, budget's one, right? How to bring people, you want to bring people back together where, where necessary, where appropriate, where helpful, and not having really had the ability to do that necessarily. And I think we've got to be really thoughtful about when it's appropriate and necessary to do it, because we swing in different places of the organisation to some people being face-to-face, -face, loads and loads, and really valuing that, and others still being really frugal and careful about it. And we don't want to have two different or more than that lived experiences of being at Cisco. So I think you've got to be very mindful of, of it. I don't know what you think. No, I, I completely agree. It is a balance. Budget is always the thing. You know, I think most leaders, if they had an infinite amount, they would bring their people together a lot more. Um, yeah, good answer. Cool, thank you. So next we have, what is, your, what is the approach you would use to, t uh, sorry, what is the approach you would take to decrease burnout cases due to remote or hybrid work? So one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that everybody's having the conversation about well-being. Well-being is, you know, be well to lead well. So that means both our leaders role modelling. And I don't just mean like going to the gym or going for a walk or something. I mean that our leaders aren't sending emails at 3 a.m., which expect people to sort of answer at 3 a.m., or that they do stuff on a Sunday night because they're catching up, which doesn't really suit their teams. So we're encouraging people's behaviours to role model and to actually, you know, Know, create the experience for your people that you want to live and the fact is we don't want to work 24 by 7 in fact we're trying to replace time we've lost in recent years where we couldn't go out and we couldn't socialize so we want to have we know we can't have work-life balance we've you know there's no such thing as getting it exactly right then we talked about integration now we just talk about life I think and uh, yeah so yeah, to you. That's a good. I mean, that's a great answer. I think it, the modeling is the biggest part for sure. Um, you know, we've done different intervention type things that have, that have worked pretty well. We had a, a Thrive Reset program that was really popular. We rolled out to our leaders. This was uh, probably midway through the pandemic, I would say, and it was a little bit about mindfulness and you know ensuring that people understand that it's okay to like t take a micro action. You don't have to do all the things at once, but take the micro action, whether it's stopping five minutes.
minutes between your meetings to breathe? Because that is one of the things we see is the meeting overrun. You know, the meeting overrun is real. People that, you know, just hour to hour or half hour to half hour. So the ability to just like take breaks in between that, I think is really important. And then you have all the questions, don't you, about professionalism. So what's professional now? Is it okay to be on a ho in a hoodie on the TV at home or on a screen at home? Or is it not okay? Do you suit up when you come to the office? What feels comfortable? We were totally tolerant of having people's children in shot. There's the famous news clip where the news readers' families crawling through the room while they're on screen. And we're okay with that. We're okay with pets in the office. Uh, pets in screen, pets come into the office. If we go back from all those things that we've done to soften our approach, I think, I personally think that'll be a mistake for our people and it won't take care of their mental health. You know, all the people who did get pets through the pandemic, which was a lot, if they now have to be in an office five days a week, we're in trouble with that and with people's happiness. And people have a massive right now to choose. They're voting with their feet, right? The great resignation isn't a lie. It's about people walking towards something else because they think the grass is greener. We're working really hard to be a magnet that shows them that the grass is, is pretty green already and that things like mental health and well-being and actually saying it, not just, you know, doing it, not just saying it, really matter. Yeah. Thank you both. So our next question is, how does Cisco create a sufficient leadership pipeline and how does Cisco develop future leaders? You go. On that one. You or me. This is fun. It's like we're playing tennis. <laughs> My forehand, your back end, who wants to? Um, so leadership development is something that we focus on pr uh, pretty deeply. And so we have several kind of programs that we run through this where we look at things like emerging leaders, where we, we all actually take leaders through a program that is kind of designed to be a do you really want to be a leader? Because sometimes you find people who are interested in leadership, but mostly because it is the promotional trajectory. It's not really that they will actually want to lead people. Leading people is very much an act of service. You know, when you lead people, you, you are, they all have to be successful, as everyone in this room knows, for you to be successful. So it's, a, it's, it's not for everybody. So we actually, with our, um, with our training, we have one emerging leader program that is more like, here's what it actually is. Is this something that you want to do? So we also, through many of traditional, many of the traditional ways, through uh, talent review pipelines, identify emerging leaders in all areas of the organization. By the way, that can go down to you know the lower grade levels. It's not just the highest levels of leadership and executive pipelines. So. I also think we've opened up our channels massively for talent. So, for example, people with, you know, it used to be about physical disability where we'd say, you know, can you get in an office? Well, obviously, there's a pool of talent there that's opened up. But there's also people who are able to come forward and talk about Asperger's or autism or yeah. things like that and ways to make that work in the workplace. So trying to think about what the right mix of the workplace is. We thought spent a lot of time thinking about men and women. You know, it's not just that, it's a lot more. Great. Thank you both. That's all the uh, time we've got for Q&A. But if you do have more questions, please post them on the WebEx team space and we'll get back to answering them uh, late, later this week. So I have one last question for you, Kelly, before we wrap up. And thank you, Laura. Um, and that's a mindset that you've been talking about that you want leaders to be in. And I think that would be something that would be helpful for this audience to sort of take with them. And you talk about being a scientist in this. Tell us more about that and perhaps what last message you'd like to leave the audience with. Yeah. Uh, so what I normally say to leaders as we're doing this, you know, I mentioned earlier, no one has all the answers. We certainly don't have all the answers. We're learning as we go and we're adjusting as we go. But Thinking like a scientist in this is what's going to help us all to be successful. Just test and learn. Test and learn. You know, that's, that's the approach that we're taking with hybrid. And again, if we're talking about this in a year, it might be a little different than the conversation we're having today because we'll have another 12 months of data and insights around what's working and how do we make work work well for everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much for listening. I know it's the end of the day. We really appreciate it's you being end. here with us. Yes. And we, uh, we've enjoyed it very much. Looking forward to the rest of the sessions. So thank you very much and good luck with it all. We're all in this together. So thank you. Thank you.
welcome back to the Cisco TV studio and our final, I can't believe it, closing broadcast of Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. We have been so grateful to have all of you with us on the live stream throughout the week and right now we are just 30 minutes away from our closing keynote with Wendy Mars, president of Cisco EMEA and the amazing Pier Luigi Colina. We're going to make that announcement coming up soon, but again, 30 minutes from now. Nish Parker is here on set with me. Hello, my dear friend. I am, Steve. I can't believe it's the end. I'm not ready for this. I'm never ready for this. <laughs> every time that we do this, I always say this is such a gift to be able to spend this time together every year. We get to bring this incredible content out to the entire world, to everybody who tunes in here on the broadcast, but we get to share this chance to come together, to look at technology, to talk about people, to elevate the energy, and let everybody know what it's like to be in the room at this incredible show. I think it's just remarkable. Absolutely, and I'm sad we've missed three years of it, but I think that's, you know, what do they say? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. It so <laughs> and does. And definitely has with us. I think it's been so great to be back together in person as hosts with the wonderful crew and attendees. I can really feel that energy of catching up on three years of missed time. Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's what we're going to do. They have just opened the doors to the keynote, so it's still a little quiet in the room. People are flooding in bit by bit. It's going to take a while to fill it up, but we're going to go out to the keynote space where my buddy Rob Boyd is hanging out, and he's found a friend. Hey, Rob. Well, the band just started here, Steve. Thank you so much. So I don't know how much I'm going to hear and how much you guys might capture, but I'll just give you the lowdown. It's exciting out here. The band just started playing. It's a good classic. But I've got a, a customer here with me that I just want to introduce himself, and I just ask you, Hubert, how are you enjoying things? Can you hear me? All right, I'll tell you. How was your week? Tell us how your week has been. Ah, uh, the week was very fine. The whole uh, event was top. Did you learn anything? Did you learn anything new that you're anxious to take back with you? Yeah, every time in life you can learn so much, and it's very cool. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. I want to thank you for coming out. I can't hear anything, so I'm going to go and throw it back to you guys. Right. Oh my goodness. Okay, well bravo for even trying. Yeah, nobody has any idea. You get into that keynote space, you cannot hear a darn no. thing out there, but bravo to both of you for holding it together. Here's what we're going to do at this point. It takes so much to bring you this broadcast, this incredible stream. Really, every single year, the opportunity to work with this Cisco TV team, they are truly the most expert professionals. Everybody who's around us, the five people who are here on the floor with us, our camera team, and everyone else, we are always so, so, so happy. The producers are incredible, um, the directors, everybody that we get a chance to work with, all the technical people that make this possible to be able to bring these stories to you. We want to share a little bit of what it looks like back behind the scenes, so you can see a little bit of it for yourself. Let's roll that VT right now. Three to four minutes, show them everything we do. Okay. You're on. Yeah. Oh, so guys, I wanted to give you a quick behind the scenes tour and I apologize because it's going to go fast. Basically, these are the broadcasting encoders well back in the closet here behind Cisco TV studios. Uh, just a brief look up here because all of our traffic for these RF hits, video and audio are coming across these antennas here, which are all replicated via, and connected via fiber at the other end of World of Solutions as well as um, keynote, keynote space as well. So this whole side is engineering. These guys are responsible for making sure that the streams are going out successfully and that everybody receives what they're supposed to receive. If something starts going wrong, these guys start panicking. Otherwise, I always look kind of sleepy, all right? As we come over here, we have RF engineering. He's getting fiber feeds as well as IP for connectivity, both of these cameras as well as the audio. Make sure it's obviously, as we can see, I'm right there coming back again. That's kind of cool. This is comms. He's got his own antenna system, but it's also replicated in the same places because we have to cover a ton of ground. So he's responsible for making sure that I can hear through this little earpiece as well as the other hosts, we can hear the director. I'm gonna stop for a brief moment and say hello to our executive producer, Simon. Thank you so much for everything. These guys are doing post-production editing along these tables here. So they are under pressure when we come back with footage that we need to make broadcast ready and on brand at a moment's notice. So keep up with me, Steve. You're walking forward. You got it easier this time. <laughs> this is all the gear setting that they do. This is the main room. So we have guests, producers, and everybody sitting here overlooking everything. I'll come back to some more detail on that in a moment. And we have the lovely Nish. Here, turn this way. Nish, it looks like she's working on a show, right? I am indeed getting ready for the final show of the week. Sad and happy at the same time. It's mixed blessing, isn't it? But she's got a show flow there where we keep all of our constantly changing notes and updates on questions, issues, themes, changes, and stuff. A little relaxation area over here. And we have Cedric in makeup. 
two lovely ladies who take care of making sure that our hair, our makeup, our faces, even the back of my head, all looks good. Cedric, you did all right? All good. Of course, this is your role that comes in here. I think it's funny. We preposition the best looking guy in here who needs this the least. I spend hours in there. With that, I'm going to throw out to Steve on the studio. Hey, brother, how you doing? Yeah, um, yeah, this is kind of where the magic happens, uh, right back over here on this side. So I am standing in Studio A. Studio B is right back over there on that side. Um, we've got this incredible team with us. So there's Ali Sones over there, our floor manager. And then we've got uh, Simon back over here, and we've got Malcolm back on this side, and we've got Mike back over here. Mark is going to kind of shoot back toward the rest of it. And then in the back, we've got Pete. We've got Alfredo running audio, and, and we're just getting ready for this last show of the show, which is just amazing. So Rob, we'll send it back out to you. Perfect, Steve. Thank you. You can see the organization that becomes important when everything is moving and flying fast. Guests, executives, engineers, you name it, flying in and out of here. The floor manager is making sure that everybody has that taken care of. We have our wonderful sound guy. I always make friends with sound. Alfredo, I appreciate all your help this week. You're awesome. And then, of course, our director. Someone has to call all the shots at the end of the day. This is the one riding the knobs. She's making sure everything goes out correctly, taking all these inputs that we've talked about, including one other input from video playback. So stuff that's been provided to us or stuff that we're editing here, including graphics like name straps and stuff like that that go on the bottom. He's going to take care of that one. We'll step over here. You're doing coloring and making sure that we have the right balance. Lights and everything are matching up from shot to shot. And let me tell you, with the sun that we've had this week coming in through the ceiling at various times a day, this man has not been allowed to relax much. Over here, I forget what we're doing, but we got remote camera as well as some shading, I believe, going on. Yeah, I don't know, you got something you're doing. You got, he's got cool knobs and controls, including even a stream deck. I like that. And then finally, I've been exchanging messages with this guy all day. You've got the pink Pelican. You are taking care of what here? Uh, the lighting. The lighting, perfect. Very, very important. He's got to work in conjunction with him to make sure that they pull off whatever the balance is. Nature, Mother Nature gives us one thing, we have to do another. With that, we got producers, and we'll go back out to the studio. So, uh, we are getting ready for our final show, which is unbelievable. I can't believe we're about to finish this thing up. So, uh, in just a moment, you're going to be able to hear back once again from Nish. You're going to be hearing from Cedric. You're going to be hearing from Rob. You're going to be hearing from me. We've had an amazing week. Hello, my friend. Brilliant job over there in the back. Thank you so much. Couldn't do it without you guys. And, of course, this awesome crew. You guys are incredible. This really is the most incredible, incredible team. Um, I always look forward to working with Cisco TV with all of you as well. It's, it, it's just a brilliant way of bringing the action, the energy, and the life of Cisco Live all together. So uh, thanks for joining us here on the tour. Rob, phenomenal job. Bye, everybody. Rob is so amazing. He actually knows everything that is going on there in the back. It's incredible whenever this happens. I'm just going to give an extra shout out right now to the, the people who I really think make this all come together. Uh, to Simon for bringing us all into the room. Uh, Carrie, Amy V, Amy P, Carissa, you guys just put together an incredible show and you're such a delight to work for and to work with. So uh, thank you all for that. So what's happening all around us here, Nish? Well, you're seeing movement. Everybody is heading to the keynote. We've got 10,000 people. This is what 10,000 people going to one <laughs> right. place looks like, just so you can see. And they're going to start filling up the keynote. I know we're going to take a look there soon as well. And yeah, I know that people are really excited. And um, the keynote is always so wonderful because you can see from the energy in the room, everybody's having those last conversations it really is a, a moment in Cisco live where everybody comes together and you see the scale of what the Cisco live community looks like absolutely all right we are going to go back out to the keynote floor and we are going to hope that Cedric can hear a word we're saying Cedric yes Steve I can I, I don't know if I'm yelling or not but this is the first time for me here in the keynote space everybody is filling up there's a band behind us I'm ready here with my glow stick as well to have a good time but I'm here with Dorit so Dorit I'm just gonna say hello um, how are you I'm fine, are you? Yeah, good. Is this your first Cisco Live? Yes, first time. And same with me, are you excited? Really excited, yes. Great, so what is your highlight of this week? Sorry if I'm yelling, right? But what is your highlight? Uh, highlight was meeting up with peers, having a great time with colleagues and uh, with the Cisco team. Great, thank you so much, Dorit. Have a good one. Great, as you can see, it's all about connecting with people. And that's what's just happening here. You can see people are having fun around us. People are just like having talks and so on, so it's great to be here. Steve, I think I'm gonna get a frog into my throat right now of yelling, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to you. 
Bravo, Cedric. You know, this is Cedric's first time joining us here on the Cisco yeah. TV broadcast team. He has done an amazing job. He's just got incredible energy. He's so dedicated to this brand, and he does such beautiful, beautiful work for us, and hopefully you've really enjoyed having Cedric here on the team as well. The rest of us are just, we've been around long enough that people are used to us. But uh, exactly. Cedric just like, he, he blended right on into yeah. the fabric of the team, right? I remember actually being out in that keynote space for the first time, and it is just so much fun just getting to spontaneously pull in these, you know, attendees to come and chat to us. I think I've had that moment where I've been screaming and shouting, not being able to hear a thing you're saying. <laughs> but I know that that's really does capture the energy, right? And having that live band and having those, you know, 10,000 people in the same room as you, it's, it's the beauty of it. It is an incredible thing. It is infectious. And this is why we always tell people, come to be a part of the event. Cisco Live happens because of you. So yes, you're tuning in, you're watching us on the broadcast now, and we deeply appreciate that, but see if you can get yourself into the room. We would love to have you make that happen. We would love to say hello to you in person. Now, one of the highlights that we had here this week is that Cedric had an opportunity to sit down with our president of Cisco EMEA, Wendy Mars. They had a great conversation. We're gonna show that to you right now. We will see you back here in about five minutes. Here we go. Well, we're still here at Cisco Life EMEA in Amsterdam. It's day three. It's our last day here. It makes me a little bit sad, but what makes me really, really, really happy is to have Wendy Mars with us in the studio. Wendy is our president of EMEA, and I'm really excited to have my good friend here with us. Wendy, how are you doing? Oh, fantastic. I'm delighted to be here with you, Cedric, because I know that you've had, you know, a number of interviews, and right. you know I'd do anything for you, as were, you know, ex-university bodies who went to Lancaster. I Not know. at the same time. I, I know. know you're a bit yep, younger than yep, me. Yep, yep, yep. No, 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 it was a great experience for me as well, Lancaster. I was happy that, that I was there. Um, so, Wendy, we are back right now here in Amsterdam, Cisco Live, in person after three years. Yeah. How do you feel? Oh, fantastic. I tell you, it's, I feel so energized. I've not had much sleep, um, but I feel so energized from the week. It's been absolutely incredible. And the feedback from our customers and our partners, Cedric, has been amazing um, so I'm really really pleased we're back together again awesome and we're so pleased to have you here with us so thank you for making some time any time um, I want to throw back to the start of Cisco life you had the keynote right the opening keynote I loved the Cisco blue that you were wearing as well that was great to be on brand um, it looked really beautiful but you mentioned in there that you're a CCIE certified yeah. right um, about 25 years ago you mentioned yeah. so for us here at Cisco, it's so important, those certifications. We have a certifications and learning corner as well. You can do them here on site. How did that accelerate your career being CCIE certified? Yeah, you know, Cedric, I, um, I took the CCIE back in mm -hmm. March of 1998. So, you know, it's tw it is 25 I'm years born ago. Born in 97. There you go. Thank you. Um, so um, so it, was, um, it, was, it was an amazing thing to do. It was really tough, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, as I said on the, uh, on the presentation, I was relieved because mm -hmm. it's so hard. But I was so proud that I achieved it because it's something that it means a lot. Um, and, you know, I look back and that has really helped me during my career to, it gives you confidence, you yeah. know, that you know the, the subject well. But I think for us in working in the technology sector, understanding the technology and how things operate, but also, you know, being familiar with how a customer uses the technology in their, in their environment as well. Because at that time, when I did that certification, I had been working in the end user at Morgan Stanley, and then I joined a partner of Cisco, a professional services company, so was working a lot with different customers. So it helps to put yourself in the shoes of people yeah. who are using the technology. Because I know you're quite personal as well, and I know that you're very passionate about, passionate about full spectrum diversity in business, yeah. and that you really care about digital education and the yes. skills gap there, right? We made some wonderful announcements here at Cisco Live that we're going to commit to uh, educating 10 million people in the next 10 years in EMEA. Why is that so important for you, Wendy? You know, it's so important because if I look at the way in which technology is used in our day-to-day -day lives, just think about how you how technology has enhanced uh, the way in which you do things. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important that people are able to become comfortable and confident uh, with the technology. And I'm very passionate about no one should be left behind. So yeah. people should be able to feel that confidence in the use of technology. It will become more pervasive in day to day in mm -hmm. societies, in more um, established uh, countries and societies and in emerging markets as well. And, you know, for us in Cisco, I'm very proud of our 
purpose statement of a sustainable and inclusive future for all and skills Absolutely. is a huge, huge part of that agenda. Absolutely. And you can see or you can truly see that here at the conference, right? We have the sustainability zone. We're really nailing down those things and we're really trying to leave the world as a better place than we found it. Right. So if I'm now going to like touch a little bit more into that, what can we do today to help Cisco achieve that goal? I think what we can do is to make sure that we are staying very close uh, with our customers, our partners, government, um, also to education systems to help to understand some of the challenges. And we can play a massive role, Cedric, in that around how we innovate, yep. how we develop, how we design, and also the skills agenda is a huge, huge thing. And you know, you know from the conversations this week, sustainability yep. is a massive area for us um, yep. globally and specifically in EMEA. Sustainability zone is super cool, and I think for people to spend some time there would be fantastic. Yeah, like we dropped by there like earlier this week. I'm, I'm actually going to go into the beehive as well a little bit later on, so that's going to be cool. But um, we are now like approaching the end of Cisco Live, unfortunately. It makes me feel really sad because this is my first one and I had a really great time. Mm. Um, I'm sure you have your, like you have a big highlight with the keynote later on today with Pierluigi. Um, I know that you had breakfast with him. Yeah. What did you have? Um, what did I have or what did he have? You can, yeah, both of you. We were both very healthy. Okay. Um, yogurt, fruit, nuts. Okay. And we had a great conversation. He is a really nice guy. Great. Um, so really looking forward to later. It's going to be fantastic. Great. I am looking forward to that. I will be also with you there in the, uh, in the theater. But if we have to summarize Cisco Life at 2023 here in Amsterdam, what are some of the key takeaways? that we think that you would uh, recommend to our viewers so i think the key takeaways are sustainability the importance of that skills the criticality of that passion enthusiasm innovation and all in together awesome we are truly all in together here thank you so much wendy for joining me here in the studio if you didn't come to cisco live this year you have to be here next year we look forward to seeing you then Man, Wendy Mars, she is such a leader. She's so inspirational, and it's because she's about people first, right? Yes. Ish, it is the passion. It's about up-leveling people's skills. It's about making them feel a part of something incredibly special and really bringing out the best in them. And I just love what Wendy talks about, compelling innovation and the power of IT and that meaningful impact on our communities. I think she is just sensational. All right, so at this point, I think uh, Rob has got somebody else out there in RF out in the keynote space, Rob. I do, actually, and now we've, we got a little further away from the band, but it's still quite an exciting environment in here. And the tunes are really good. There's stuff at least I know how to dance to as an old guy. But I found a partner with us who's actually, well, he's a fan of mine, so I'm like, yeah. oh, we have to have him on. Tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, Ali McKean, I'm from uh, the UK, a uh, Cisco partner that's uh, working very heavily around programmability, trying to build new innovation practice. Uh, really exciting space to be in, and very untapped opportunity for new partners like ourselves. Yeah, great, great opportunity. Brought 50 customers over. So we've had a... I apologize. Thank you. We're going to go back over to the studio now. All oh, right. no, we're going to go over to Cedric. Oh, what are you doing, my man? I'm just having so much fun here. I'm just going to try. I was dancing with the crew here. As you can see, they're having so much fun as well. It's the place to be. As you can see, he's way better than I am, right? But I am just going to go to, just a, an attendee here, I'm going to ask stand up. What is your name? My name is Abdullah. I'm from Germany. Hey, Abdullah, how are you? Is this your first Cisco Live or how many times have you been? It's not my first Cisco Live. It's for the second time I'm here. The second time. And what's your favorite thing about Cisco Live? Why do you keep returning? It's all about the tech, brilliant knowledge what I'm getting from the great people here. And this motivates me to come back every time and get me amazed by all of the technical information thrown at me and then get back home and implement those and implement those use cases with, uh, to my customers. Great, it's so loud in here. I hear brilliant knowledge, but other than that, I couldn't catch that much. But thank you so much. Enjoy the keynote. We're going to go back to the studio right now. Back to you, Stephen Ish. This shows you what happened when I take my eye off the ball for even a fraction of a second, right? We chit chat away about our exciting week. We thought week. Steve was a professional, but no, Steve is no <laughs> professional. He drifts away from the camera right where we need him most. Um, talk to us about when you're out here on the show floor, yes. what do you look for in the keynote space? What do I look for in the keynote space? The energy yeah. is something that really kind of, um, do you mean in terms of in, uh, guests? Because I 
go through all of the aisles. It's actually quite interesting because some people are really excited to speak to us and we love having those people on the broadcast and bringing them to our audience. Some people kind of look at us and they're like, oh, do I want to speak to them? But Rob's way of having this iPad, which says, will you join me for an interview? I think that's really working. We showed that at the start of the week for the keynote show. So. We love speaking to a diverse group of guests, right? We have people from all over EMEA. You are also great at finding leadership, right? You'll find the executives up there in the front row or in the second row and be like, oh, come up and talk to <laughs> yeah. us about what the event's been like. But I think the leaders, they're the ones that are also speaking in a lot of the sessions coming up in the week especially. So I think they're really excited to share what they're passionate about, what their teams are leading, and, you know, their experience of the event because they're an attendee just like us. They just have so much excitement and, and you know, to share with the rest Absolutely, of the absolutely. All right, so um, if we were to try to, like, take down what the highlights of the week have been, what we have thought was most special. There was just way, way, way too much to cover, but we did put together a short little VT reel for you. Just an opportunity for you to get a little peek at what some of our favorite moments of the week was. Just roll that now. Isn't it great to be back together again? As a team, we're all in. And you know what? We're just getting started. really proud to be here. It's great to be in Amsterdam. I love it. What an incredible company Cisco is. Amazing. So my question for all of you is, what has been your favorite moment of Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam? Share it with us, right? Social media team is still here. They're on site. They still want to hear from all of you. Remember, use hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. We want to hear from every single one of you. So keep on reaching out to us all the way up to the very end. Nish, what has been a, like a super highlight for you of the show? If you had to pick one, what would Ooh, it be? One. Yes, you get one. I'm going to say my interview with our Chief People Officer Kelly Jones. Yeah. I think that was interesting just to hear a different perspective on how the people and culture strategy that all our customers and partners are working on is just as important right, as the technology. And especially when it comes to hybrid work, they really complement each other. It's not one or the other, it's definitely an and. And I think you know what she had to say about inclusivity, you know how um, culture is really important to hybrid work as well. Really interesting. I love that conversation with her. Yeah, I had a. It was really delightful to play that because we played that today, just about a couple of shows ago. And to listen to your conversation, she is all about the human, and you know me. I'm always human first, even within a, a technological organization. It only matters if we are actually playing to people's strengths, uplifting them, giving them those additional skills, and making it valuable for them. I, I think my highlight was an interview as well. I think getting oh, yeah. a chance to sit down with Jonathan Davidson. He had, in my view, the quote of the entire show, right? This whole idea that we are looking for this big, cozy blanket of unified experiences, and that's really what we've created here throughout the show. You spent a lot more time out in the world of solutions yes. than I did, so I think that unification story, all the different pieces coming together, how they all play off of one another to create that true one Cisco end-to-end -end portfolio, Jonathan did a beautiful job of kicking off our keynote right at the beginning of the conference with that idea, and it was really a delightful moment for me. And you know, whenever I hear unified experiences, I can't help but think of Cisco Live, because I feel like that really is what it is. Every time we've spoken to a customer or an attendee, whether they're here in the world of solutions, anywhere they are, which is just about to close, and everyone's Whoa. heading to the keynote now, so I'm not sure if you can hear that. <laughs> But any time that we speak to anybody, that's the first thing they say. My favorite thing about Cisco Live and why I keep coming back again and again is to speak and, you know, give my peers a hug or a handshake and catch up on the last year and in this case, the last three years. Absolutely. All right, my friend, we are going to go right back out to the keynote space. According to my clock, we are six minutes away from our closing keynote of the show. Let's go out to Cedric, who is somewhere out there on the keynote floor.
Yes, Steve, I'm still here on the keynote floor. As you can see, it's getting really busy. People are coming in in masses, and I found my other victim here on the keynote floor to just ask a few questions. So, hey, how are you? What's your name? Yeah, my name is Stefan. Okay, I, well, glad that you're here with us at Cisco Live. How many times have you been here? It's my first time. Your first time, it's the yeah. same like me. Are you liking it so far? It's amazing. It's a great way to get uh, inspiration from, from uh, all the other, yeah, uh, providers in the uh, in this business awesome great thank you like you had three days here at Cisco live yeah. we've seen many cool things what's the coolest thing that you've seen I've seen all sorts of ways to automate your business to, uh, to do things easier better and uh, still have it more complex and secure and uh, it's very awesome uh, for, I've uh, learned about uh, learned a lot about uh, NetBrain and uh, I think it's a uh, very cool software yeah. Cool, great. That sounds literally like Cisco to me, Steve. That is Cisco, what we represent and so on. I'm still yelling a little bit because, you know, it's just still loud out here. People are coming in, people are having fun. The band is playing, I love it. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to you there. Thank you, Cedric. I appreciate it. Keep on finding those fabulous people. We uh, we appreciate all the work that you're putting in. Like you said, it gets a little hard. You can't hear anything. <laughs> yeah. People are crazy. They just want to get directly to the keynote. So, Nish, I want to briefly touch on the hybrid story that's come out of this show, right? So, every time we talk hybrid, everybody starts to think, oh, it just means that I can sit at home in my office and I can work. Hybrid is so much more than that. So, yeah, we take a tone that is work from home, work from office, work from anywhere. But what we also need to play into is the security aspects of hybrid, the ability to bring teams together from all over the world, whether, wherever they happen to be. We always want to talk about the security of making sure that no matter where you go, you have access to any application, to anyone on your team, whatever you want to do. And then, of course, it's all about the sustainability aspects of hybrid as well. We can all go out and just spend huge amounts of money yeah. and waste tons and tons of energy, but it's just an incredible opportunity for us to really go to what the future of work looks like, right? And I really enjoyed actually the conversation we've had this week on sustainability because we've covered it extensively. It was covered in the keynote through all of the different sessions that we had. Um, I loved learning about the UCS X series. That was a new learning for me, right? And how it's all modular. So it's like Lego, it's customizable. You can choose what is perfect for your business and what works for you. Um, and then when you need to swap out a component, you just swap that one out. So there's less e-waste, it's more efficient. It's exactly what customers need, um, which is great just, you know, to have the right technology in the right use case cases, but also, you know, doing good for the planet at the same time. And this is what All In is all about. It's a sense of commitment, right? Uh, anybody can build technology capabilities. Being All In means that you think about it from every single perspective. You do what the uh, people need, you do what the world needs, you listen to your customers, you listen to your partners, and it's just impressive. All right, so we're going to head back out to the keynote space. Things are getting crazy out there. Rob Boyd, how you doing? I see you in there, Steve and Nish. Oh, what do you say? Hey, we're having fun out here quite a bit. So, uh, the Cisco employee, I just love what she's doing with her programs. I just wanted to give her a chance to tell us a little bit about well, who you are and what you've been doing this week. What's good to remember here? Yes, my name is Aurelia Takis. I lead diversity, equity, inclusion for Global CX Centers. And no, it's just great to see such great diversity and focus on an inclusive future, empowering an inclusive future for all, and uh, seeing the great, a lot more women too, so that's very exciting. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, it's been an exciting week here, connecting with so many people and seeing all the amazing work that Cisco and our customers and partners are doing. So, very exciting. That is awesome. How long have you been, you've been at Cisco, what, 13, 14 13, years? 13 years, yeah. How many Cisco Lives? This is my first, so I'm oh. super excited. Congratulations. Thank you so much for taking the time. Guys, I'm going to go back to dancing and sweating here in a minute. I'll let you sit back down and join your friends who won't talk to me. This is so much fun, guys, out here. I hope, are you getting a feel for it, Steve? You feel it? Absolutely. The energy comes all the way through. You guys are doing an amazing job. Rob, Cedric, so much fun to play with all of you here this week. Uh, we are really grateful for the opportunity to, 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 to gather together and tell these stories. And Nish, it's always such a delight to be here in the studio with you. Thank oh, you, my friend, for a fantastic, you. fantastic week. You've had fun? I've had so much fun. You know, I've been counting down the days for three years. I can't remember what number Simon said at the start, our executive producer, but I think it's a thousand and something since the last time we were here. We've switched from Barcelona to Amsterdam. It's great to be in a new city. I've learned that it's not as warm in Amsterdam as it was in Barcelona. <laughs> so I've been loving that. Rob and I have been talking about crossing the wrong side of the road. We get the experience of the city it's in, and that's what really situates us, you know, at Cisco Live. It's as much about exploring the city with our friends and being here in person in the evenings as, as it is, you know, enjoying it and during the day as well. Love it, love it. Always a pleasure, my friend. Well, guess what? 
If you missed anything during the broadcast, you can catch up on all of it at CiscoLive.com. Check out the on-demand library. We are so close in to the keynote. Thanks to everybody who has been a part of it, of our partner sessions. You are what makes Cisco Live amazing. We are headed into that keynote. It's about 30 seconds or so from now. Wendy Mars, the amazing Pierre Luigi Colina for six consecutive years from 1998 to 2003. The International Federation of Football History and Statistics named Pierre Luigi the world's best referee. And now we've got him right here in the keynote space, here at the world's greatest conference. So in just a moment, we're going to head out to Wendy Mars and to Pierre Luigi. Again, I want to give our thanks to not only my co-hosts, to Nish, to Rob, to Cedric, to everybody here on the Cisco TV team, to our producers, our directors, all of our amazing camera people, comms people, audio folks. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. We're going to head to the keynote right now. Enjoy.